Number 10, Overshadowed and the Beard. Hatshepsut for a long while was content to play the supporting role among Egypt's royals, but when she decided she wasn't anymore, things took a turn. She was the daughter of Thutmose I and wife slash sister to her half brother Thutmose II. I know, don't worry, I'll address it later in the video, stay tuned. When he died in 1479 BC and left their son as heir, she took on the role as regent to Thutmose III, but she basically just acted as the rightful ruler. As the young king came, of age finally, she declared herself pharaoh. The strangest part was that she chose to portray herself in pictures as a man with a male body and a false beard. She said that the god Amun was her father and insisted that he commanded her to take charge of Egypt. Who's gonna argue with a god, right? But no one could quite explain the issue with the beard. Nevertheless, during her reign, it was a time of peace and prosperity for Egypt. Number 9, Sesostris. Sesostris was one of the greatest military commanders in Egyptian history, who was celebrated for the extent of his conquests. He stretched the kingdom further than anyone before him, but he was not without his quirks. According to accounts by Herodotus, Sesostris left pillars on every battlefield. Along with the usual bragging and boasting of how he won, he would carve into them images of genitalia, like people do on the bathroom stalls, you know? If he thought that his enemy fought valiantly, he carved a If he thought they didn't put much of a fight, he would carve a Great. Yeah, that just goes to show what he thought about things, huh? The latter was a sign of disrespect for his subdued enemies, while the other was a sign of honor, like, hey man, you stuck it to me. Apparently, some even stood the test of time, lasting over 1500 years, and seen firsthand by Herodotus himself. For those of you who don't know, for reference, Herodotus is considered as the father of historians, one of the very first to take up the task. Number eight, ceremonial seating. The whole idea behind the pharaohs was that they were direct descendants from the gods themselves. Therefore, they too had deific powers and had the capability of restoring life to the land. The Nile River had significant importance to the people of Egypt. Egypt. It provided fertile soil and water irrigation. It was pretty awesome. In order to ensure its abundance would continue, pharaohs would organize a festival where they would ceremoniously fill it with their seed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Some historians believe that this was in honor of the creation story of how life came to be and therefore it was kind of like a fertility festival. Crowds would gather at the Nile and await the arrival of their pharaoh. They would then disrobe and give their pleasure into the river to ensure its bounty. Some historians say it was just the pharaoh who did this while others say that the men joined in after. Evidence still remains pretty slim as to whether this really did happen so take this one with a grain of salt but that's not to say that there isn't any evidence at all that it did happen, so there. Number seven, Valley of the Kings. While March 2020 wasn't the best month of all time by any means, Egyptian officials did locate a secret vault hiding in the sands of the Valley of the Kings in Egypt. Just off the west bank of the Nile, the Valley of the Kings, as its name hints towards, is a pretty historical part of Egypt's past. Again, do we want to open this vault? Probably not, but did we? Yes. Bones and goo and history. What do you know? Surprise, surprise. Number six, 2020 tombs. Summer 2020, nice. While most of us was stuck inside watching Netflix, more than 100 sealed coffins were found. And yes, they were occupied for the most part. Found, of course, in Saqqara, Egypt, Egyptian archaeologists have never been more excited. Maybe we'll find the body of Cleopatra. Wouldn't that just be dandy? The fact that we found over 100 of these still in great shape is mind-blowing. Grave robbers have been around since ancient Egyptian days, and for all these to be untouched for this long is honestly unbelievable. These findings date back to 712 BC, which was a period where Egypt was controlled by foreign civilizations. That's what makes this so insane. Like Persians and Greeks, they were all around at this time. The idea that we're finding mummies is great and all, but again, do we need to open all of them up? Maybe there's treasure, maybe there's bodies. Either way, it's not yours. <laughs> Am I insane? Maybe I'm insane. Do we need to find Alexander the Great this badly that we're willing to disrespect this many souls in the process? Number five, Luxor tomb. We've been saying 2,500 years ago, and don't get me wrong, that's an awful long time to go, but in 2014, archaeologists discovered a 4,000-year-old tomb from the 11th dynasty, tucked away in Luxor, Egypt, of course, as this list says. Spanish archaeologists found a tomb belonging to a leader from the 11th dynasty, and it's pretty obvious that this was somebody from the royal family or somebody who was a high-ranking official, because at the time, Luxor was the capital city of ancient Egypt, and officials also believe this tomb could have been used as a mass grave. The important thing to note here is that the tomb had also been used during the 17th dynasty because tools and utensils from that later time were also found in this grave. 
We're gonna find a spork in 5,000 years and be like, ah yes, ancient tools, interesting. Number four, 210 sarcophagi. So we thought it was a pretty big deal when 160 bodies were recently discovered in Egypt. This was back in September 2020. Over 160 coffins were found. Wild, right? Well, those are rookie numbers, turns out. For this one, archaeologists found 210 sarcophagi near Queen Nefertiti's funerary temple in the city of the dead, Saqqara. Yeah, there were over 160, surprise. Maybe next time you check in with us, that number will be even higher. Who knows? Hopefully, slash maybe hopefully not. I don't know how I feel about this. This was January 2021. We probably would have seen it on the news, but that was when 768 people were storming the capital, so the news was a bit busy, I guess. Thanks. These sealed coffins were untouched for thousands of years. They went from finding 160 to finding 210. That's incredible. According to the ministry, the sarcophagi were completely closed and haven't been opened since they were buried at all. They opened a few though, of course, just to analyze and display them, but that's it. Yeah, leave the rest. I'm not focused on ancient curses or Brennan Fraser having to come out and save the day. Just let dead people lay where they are. Let them rest. The amount of effort got into hiding and preserving their memory alone. I mean, look how long it's taken for us to even find these things. It's almost like they didn't want to be found. Number three, the ancient curse. The walls of some of these tombs have warnings from the gods, which is a lot. One of them warning trespassers that the gods will wring their neck like that of a goose. Also, if I walked into somebody's property now and it said trespassers' necks will be wrung out like a goose, I would turn back. I wouldn't want to investigate further. I would just walk away. You don't need to be an ancient god to get that message across, you know what I mean? But inside the found tomb of the vizier Ankhamor, a pharaoh's official from 4,000 years ago, a curse was written. Buried in a mastaba, an above ground massive tomb, was this warning. Might do against this, my tomb, the same shall be done to your property. It also warns of the vizier's knowledge of secret spells and magic, and threatens to fill impure intruders with a fear of seeing a ghost. Yeah, there's that or beware of dog. I don't know, you can pick which is more impactful on your property, sure. Number two, the animal tombs. This tomb was found, as you may have guessed, in the Valley of the Kings. You're getting good, nice. But this one doesn't sound like the rest. I mean, for starters, it's a number rather than a name. What in the Elon Musk is happening here? Whose name was a number, huh? KV-52 was discovered in 1906 by Edward Ayrton. Tomb KV-50, KV-51, and this one, KV-52, they all form a group referred to as the animal tombs. Underneath six feet of debris, the entrance to these vaults were found, so when we enter this tomb, specifically KV-52, that's been untouched, ideally, for thousands of years, we can look forward to finding anything. In fact, whatever we do find, it's a win. It helps complete this age-long puzzle. So when officials opened KV-52 and it was completely empty, well, that doesn't feel too nice. Something here is wrong. It was empty except for two boxes. Both were black and undecorated, which is odd considering what we've learned on this list. The larger of the two contained the remains of a monkey, and the smaller one was a canopic chest that had four compartments in it. Hauntingly bare compared to what else we've seen on this list, but it gets a little better. We're not done yet. Finally, number one, Queen Nefertiti's hidden chamber. When researchers are 90% sure about something, that's a pretty good sign. You only say you're 90% sure of something when you know for sure, for sure. You leave 10% in case anything else goes wrong out of your control, right? 90%, that's confident, we got this. So when Egyptian authorities said they're 90% sure there's a hidden chamber in King Tut's tomb, well, we got a little jazzed, a little, got some jazz hands going on. Not gold, jazz hands. Back in 2015, a paper was published on the burial of Queen Nefertiti. Archaeologist Nicholas Reeves argued that while conducting scans on the ancient site, Reeves found what resembled traces of doors beneath the plaster. Now, it's been considered previously by archaeologists that King Tut's mask, having ear piercings and all, suggests that at that time, that tomb and that death mask was actually meant for Queen Nefertiti, not King Tut. But because King Tut died suddenly when he was 19, plans had to quickly change. 90% sure is good enough for me. What do you guys think? Comment down below all your thoughts. Number two, Ramses II with a vengeance. As some of you may know, Ramses II was the greatest of the rulers of the 19th dynasty and second longest reigning pharaoh ever. He lived to the age of 90, was an amazing warrior, leading the armies of Egypt by the age of 22, and has literal tons of statues of himself all over Egypt. He is also probably a lot of people's ancestors since he had 96 sons and 60 daughters, approximately. So yeah, it was kind of a big deal in 1881 when archaeologists discovered his mummy with a whole bunch of other ones in a secret chamber at Deir al-Bari. Originally, Ramses was buried in the Valley of the Kings, as he should have been. But because of the risk of grave robbings, he was moved to a secret chamber. 
And then, after his discovery and stay at the museum in Cairo, he was moved again in the 70s when he got a passport to travel to Paris. This guy gets around. Number nine, Rosetta Stone. You are too fine to be laying down in bed alone. I can teach you my language, Rosetta Stone. Man, we all miss the old Drake. Girl, don't tempt me. Anyway, speaking of diamonds in the rough, the Rosetta Stone, pretty, pretty shocking and important find. What is it? Well, basically, it's a large stone tablet that has the same paragraph written on it in three separate languages. Why is this so important, you may ask? Well, it's basically helped us learn everything we know about ancient Egypt. More specifically, translating Egyptian to Greek and then to English. Or, since it was discovered by some of Napoleon's people and forces, uh, it would have been in French. To put it in modern terms, it's as if you were back in grade 11 reading Shakespeare and not understanding a single word. But then the bully in school finds the cliff notes for Romeo and Juliet and decides to do a nice thing and share them with everybody. Yep, that makes sense. Good euphemism. That's a good one. Number eight, Khufu's ship. When pharaohs passed on into the afterlife, they put a whole whack of stuff inside their tombs that were meant to come with them into the next plane of existence. It's why we see the mummified versions of their favorite cats and dogs, favorite foods, and tons of treasure. Unfortunately, after you're gone and buried, some opportunistic people are gonna bust down your tomb doors and steal all your stuff. I'd like to see those grave robbers steal what Khufu brought with him. In 1954, archaeologists found out that, among other things, Khufu had a 140 foot boat with his name on it, buried in pieces at the base of the Great Pyramid where he was entombed. It was almost perfectly intact, and after digging it out of the ground, they put it on display at the Solar Boat Museum, right next to where it was buried. Hopefully, that's close enough for Khufu to still use it in the afterlife. Number seven, deliver me naked. Cleopatra is known as one of the most beautiful women in history, but this could be due to how she used her feminine wiles to get what she wanted. Her beauty and cunning became renowned as a result. While other queens, like the one I mentioned before, concealed their beauty, Cleopatra was all about showing it off, cause girl, if you got it, flaunt it. In order to help secure the political ally and power connected to Caesar, Cleopatra knew how to make an entrance and knew how to win over a guy. It's, it's pretty easy. He was around 52 when they met and the Egyptian queen was just like 20 and in her prime, so she looked great. She smuggled herself into Alexandria where Caesar was staying, had her servant tie her up in a bed sack, naked, and carried indoors to Caesar and she was like, have at her, buddy. In other words, she wrapped her naked body in a carpet, made Caesar's jaw drop to the floor, and secured one of the most beneficial unions on the spot. Honestly, not really messed up. Kind of badass. Honestly, just do your thing. Work it, girl. I dream of having that confidence with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Go, girl. You got this. You get that empire. Number six, Cats and the Battle. Ancient Egypt would have welcomed the film the adaptation of Cats, unlike the rest of the world, with open arms and probably would have built a shrine to it. Giant human cats eating human cockroaches would be revered. Bottom line, cats in ancient Egypt were worshipped and treated like family. It was considered a crime punishable by death to harm one due to the belief in the goddess Bastet. One pharaoh even risked losing a battle because of cats themselves. The Battle of Pelusium of 525 BCE between Pharaoh Samek III and the Persian king Cambyses II resulted in the first Persian conquest of Egypt all because of cats. Cambyses took advantage of the cat loving side of Egypt and used hostages of cats and animals as leverage. So they were just kind of like, well we can't, we can't fight if the cats are let loose. What are we going to do? We can't kill the cats. And that's, that's uh, how they lost that battle. Number five, honey coated. Who here hates bugs bothering them in the summer? unless they're a bumblebee because we love bumblebees here, right guys? But me too. No one likes the buzzing of blood suckers nipping at your skin while you're chilling out on the beach or barbecue. Well, guess what? Egyptian pharaohs hated it too, except they didn't have bug spray. So what did they do? Well, you know the phrase, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? Well, they took that literally. Conveniently, they had servants around them at all times, so to help with the bug problem, they covered them with honey so as to distract the bees and the bugs. So as the pharaohs lounged on the sand, or wherever they were, their dutiful servants took on the job of taking on the bug bites. King Pepe, for instance, had a dedicated slave in his entourage who endured it every day. Poor guy. It was so effective that he had one designated in each room. Poor guys. Number four, assassins. This wasn't necessarily something that he did, but something that happened to him that was pretty messed up. As you can guess from the title, it involved assassins. 
Prince. Ramses III had a lot on his plate during his reign. There were this group of seafarers trying to destroy everyone, the tomb builders did their first labor strike over wage delays, I get you, the economy was deteriorating, weather was devastating, food production, things were corrupt as hell. And on top of all this, his secondary wife T.A. hated his guts. She along with a dozen members of his harem, the head of the treasury, a military captain, a butler, the butler did it, and the chief royal chamberlain hatched an assassination plot. In 2012, researchers used a high powered CT scanner on Ramsey's mummy and saw a massive throat gash covered by an amulet said to have healing powers. The researchers summarized that an assassin cut through Ramsey's esophagus and trachea, killing him practically instantly because he probably would have just let out that fast. Some other research suggests that this happened before the other assassination plot unraveled, but either way, not a good way to go. Number 3. Till death do us part. Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning? Well. If you were a servant to a pharaoh in ancient Egypt, you were hoping that your dude lived a long time because once they bite the dust, so did you. Now keep in mind, ancient Egyptians believed strongly in the afterlife, so when you died you didn't just disappear, you literally just traveled to another world. That's the whole idea behind religion anyway. The discovery team organized by NYU, Yale, and the University of Pennsylvania discovered macabre evidence of this tradition. While excavating the mortuary ritual site of Pharaoh Aha, they found six graves not far from his tomb. They were skeletons of court officials, servants, artisans who appear to have been sacrificed to serve the pharaoh in the afterlife. Aha's successor, Dajir, had more than 200, which are also presumed to be sacrificial burials as well. Number two, Marrying your siblings. Again, remember the thing I mentioned before and now I'm actually getting to it? I promised, I promised, and here we are. Not so long ago, it was normal to court your very own cousin, but today that would be considered a very large taboo. I'm not gonna lie, it gives me the skippies, okay? I don't like imagining ma even marrying any of my cousins, that's weird to me. But the ancient Egyptians took things even farther, or should I say brought it closer, by marrying their very own siblings. Hey. That's one way to guarantee that the line will stay in the family. But knowing what we know about the genetic pool being too close and the complications that can arise, there's things that can go wrong. But nevertheless, it happened. DNA testing from King Tut's corpse revealed that he was a product of a union between two siblings. Pharaohs believed that they were descended from the gods. Therefore, keeping it in the family was crucial in maintaining that bloodline. King Tut even married his own half-sister, same dad, when he was just 10 years old. However, generations of inbreeding resulted in a bone disease that got more severe each time. Cleopatra also married her own brother as well. That was a that was a whole thing, and then she met Caesar and that whole thing we talked about. Yeah, that thing. Let's move on. Number one, Akhenaten. One of the most polarizing figures in Egyptian history, Akhenaten tried to get rid of religion and as a result they got rid of him. Akhenaten earned the title of heretic king and a recent discovery has revealed that his deeds might have been a lot darker. Akhenaten came to power in the 1350s and reigned for around 17 years. He is known for creating a new religion surrounding Aten, who was generally represented as a sun disk. Sometime around his fourth year he started sending out agents to erase names and images of certain gods from existing texts and monuments. Around the fifth year, he claimed to discover the location of the new royal city and moved Egypt's capital from Thebes to Akhetaten, today known as Tel El Amarna. There, his people suffered greatly under slave labor, with bodies being uncovered younger than 20, many with bones broken, spines broken, along with evidence of severe malnutrition. When the pharaoh finally passed, his tomb remained unfinished and his name was stricken from the history books. At least now, we can see why. At number 10, the creation. Every religion and civilization from the dawn of humanity has come up with their own unique stories as to how the world was created. Some civilizations have credited aliens, others have credited a benevolent god, and many of these gods have their own unique ways of creating life. Though we've heard stories of gods creating people out of things like corn or mud or just thin air, I don't think these stories could even compare to the ancient Egyptian story of creation. These ancient people believed that their very first god, Atum, created himself. As such, he had no wife and literally no one else to potentially procreate with, and so to create his and thus create humanity, he, well, he busted Literally, he just gave himself a one to meat massage and boom. Out of that process, he created his kids, Shu and Tefnut. 
a very fitting name if you ask me. This legend, I guess you could say, created the term the god's hand. And this was used to refer to women back in ancient Egypt, since a tomb's hand played the quote unquote female role in the creation of his offspring. This term was also carried over into other civilizations, like in the Greco-Roman period, so if you ever hear someone say god's hand, now you know where that came from. At number 9, cheating death. These days, if you get caught cheating on your partner, the worst that could happen to you is you break up, or you get a divorce, or maybe even get exposed on social media. But back in the times of ancient Egypt, the punishment for adultery was much, much worse than having your relationship end. Instead, your life would be the thing that ends. Obviously, in any civilization, any kind of relationship can always happen outside of a marriage. The only varying difference is the punishment for it. For the ancient Egyptians, being caught having an adulterous relationship was punishable by death. Pretty harsh for having a sneaky link, but I guess they took their relationships much more seriously back then. One of the most famous cases of a serial adulterer, if you will, came from a man named Peneb, who was known to sleep with many married women and even had his own son join in on his escapades too. As you can imagine, things didn't really end well for them, so if you ever go back in time to ancient Egypt, just be careful of who you sleep with. Before we continue talking about some of the things that your teachers might not have taught you about ancient Egypt, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Ancient WAP. Last year, there was a huge scandal concerning Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion's song WAP. It's a pretty racy song that had a lot of people up in arms about it, and it was all over the news. I mean, if you ever heard any songs from the early 2000s, then you would know that this kind of musical content really isn't a new thing, and sexual songs have been a part of society for a really long time, but it might surprise you to know that they even had some risque songs even back in the times of ancient Egypt. Historians have discovered some of these songs, one of which I can recite to you, and it uses some pretty imaginative wording to describe a woman's body. In an excerpt from said song, it says, quote, the one, the sister without peer, the handsomest of all. She looks like the rising morning star. At the start of a happy year, shining bright, fair of skin, lovely the look of her eyes, sweet the speech of her lips, she has not a word too much. Upright neck, shining breast, her hair true lapis lazuli, arms surpassing gold, fingers like lotus buds, heavy thighs, and narrow waist. Her legs parade her beauty. With graceful steps, she treads the ground, captures my heart with her movement. End quote. Now, it's no WAP, but for the ancient Egyptians, it was pretty spicy. Number 7, Mummy Workshop. Here's a recent discovery for you. Archaeologists in 2018 discovered a well-preserved embalming workshop complete with labeled oils. Ooh. What's an embalming workshop, you ask? Well, it's the place where kings go to shed a few pounds. Ooh. By that, I mean have their organs removed to be pickled in jars for the afterlife. My favorite part of this process is removing the brain. Because, you know, you don't need that. Lots of folks walk around without those all the time. Basically, you get a long hook surgical tool and you find the good pink stuff up here through the nose. After stirring the pharaoh's memories like an Italian baker mixing bread dough, you flip the royal over and just let that all drain out till she's empty. I legitimately get queasy when talking about the stuff, that's not a joke, I, I seriously do. But you know what, I'm glad we found the place and smarter people than I understand it. All I know is that if an Egyptian embalmer asks you to lick the spoon, you say no. Don't do it. Number six, construction manifest. You know, a lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries. But like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? You know? What stumped people about the pyramids is how they were built. So for our next discovery, how about the discovery of a port in 2013 that had a piece of papyri? Isn't that so much more exciting than a massive 138 meter tall building? Mm-hmm. The piece of papyri actually was a sort of manifesto for those massive buildings. It basically said, the limestone used in the Great Pyramid was shipped from a quarry at Tura to Giza along the Nile River. It also said that it took four days, and it talked a little bit about how long Khufu was in charge of Egypt and the guy who was in charge of building the pyramids. See, it's, it's very exciting. Number five, can't take it with you. In life, you live and then you pass on. If you believe in the home send signs your mom hangs up in her kitchen, then there's gonna be a lot of living, laughing, and loving with that. Ancient Egyptians believed in taking things with them to the afterlife. 
yeah, pretty much everything was coming with them. Gold, treasure, organs, except the brain, and pretty much just anything you would need for that kind of adventure. Well, animals were no different. Oftentimes when discovering tombs of kings in the main chamber, or sometimes in their own, were statues of cats and dogs, and naturally, mummified kitties and doggies. Now, I love my pets just as much as the next guy, but uh, a discovery in 2019 revealed a tomb with statues, mummies, and even some preserved crocodiles. Ooh, weird, that's a weird pet. Number four, Tomb KV5. Sometimes you pass things off without giving them the proper time and attention. Like the fact that your middle toe on one of your feet is a little longer than the same one on the other side, and you're like, ah, it's probably fine, but it's actually a mutation that all of your ancestors had, and it's the reason you can walk faster than everyone else. Not that that's happened to me or anything, but the archaeologists of Tomb KV-5 know what I'm talking about, sort of. Basically, KV-5 was not studied very well, and in 1995, it turns out that it was actually one of the largest tombs ever created in the Valley of the Kings. So far, we have found around 121 chambers and corridors, and we think there will be 150 total. The tomb was used for the sons of Ramses II, who as we know had over 100 kids, so the size of the tomb kind of checks out. So far we've only confirmed 6, but there are likely to be around 20 of his sons down there. Number 3, the Pyramids of Giza. A lot of people include the Great Pyramids of Giza on their list of Egyptian discoveries, but like, how, how, could, how could you miss them? Okay, obviously people can see these bad boys from miles away. It would be kind of hard to lose something like that, as Adam said. But then again, as a man, I take pride in losing my car keys every time I need to use them. But more specifically, it was the discovery of the inner chambers of the pyramids that really kicked off archaeology. The verdict? Well, these pyramids not only hold riches and riches of historical knowledge, but the engineering involved is out of this world, which, you know, is kind of how some people think they were constructed today. The complexity and craftsmanship the complexity and craftsmanship still has people scratching their heads. As for me, I believe that with enough careful planning and engineering, mixed in with a whole heap of uh, forced labor, you can just get about anything done. There's still much to be learned about these giants in the desert. Ooh. Number two, Aten. Even today, we are still making huge discoveries in Egypt. I mean, maybe not specifically today, April 27th, or whenever you watch this, but in this day and age. In 2020, we discovered a 3,000 year old city buried in the sand, and it's probably the biggest discovery since our number one spot. The city named Aten, or the Rise of Aten, is the largest city of its kind that we have found and gives us a really good look at life during Egypt's most profitable era. That would be the rule of Amon. That would be the rule of Amonhotep III. Amonhotep IV is his son, who would drastically change the country's direction. Following his father's death, the fourth changed his name to Akhenaten, abandoned the old Egyptian gods besides the sun god Aten, and moved the royal seat from Thebes to the new city of Akhetaten, which is known as Amarna. He was a weird one, but this city wasn't weird. It was impressive, with an administration area as well as residential districts, production area where mud bricks, amulets, and other goods for buildings and temples were made, along with a bakery. Yeah, I love my croissants covered in sand too. Number one, King Tut. The man, the myth, the legend. Besides the pyramids, the sand, and the hot sun, nothing is more famous out of Egypt than King Tut. Well, why is this? Is he not just another royal bro who's just big chilling in his tomb? Eh, yeah, sort of, but his tomb is very unique actually. Unfortunately for Egyptians and archaeologists alike, a lot of the tombs have been cleaned out by grave robbers and crooks, some of which are just long gone. The stuff could have been heisted at any point really, we're just not sure. King Tut's tomb, however, was pretty well untouched, and because of this, we got the chance to learn about a king who really didn't do too much. I think the sarcophagus stands out the most, the, the gold and the blue, it's beautiful. I love it. It's good aesthetic. And at number 10 is jewelry making. Egyptians saw deep spiritual significance in their jewelry, but also had a love of aesthetics. And those two things combined to create some of the most unique and lavish jewelry found in history. Worn to ward off spirits, protect health, bring good luck, and more, there were even certain colors and designs that were associated to certain gods and powers. And so Egyptian jewelers 
followed very strict rules regarding the mystical aspects of their jewelry creations. While a woman usually would not be a metal worker in Egyptian society, it was very common for her to be making jewelry. The tools were smaller and the process required less heat and thus less danger for her. Metal work techniques included precious metal sheets that were cut and shaped, notched together. Wire work was accomplished through strip twisting. Pieces could be held together with this wire stripping system or crimping techniques. These strips were also how link chains were accomplished as well as the securing of beads or the backs of earrings. And for jewelry designed exclusively for burial, the metal was often quite thin, as the jewelry of the deceased was not subjected to the wares of everyday life. Precious stones, ivory, real flowers, and shells were all common ornaments, as was name engravements, but it was more common with royalty. Jewelry makers were women of high status due to these contributions and the revelry jewelry held in ancient Egypt. For number nine, it's house vendors. Recognized as an ancient heritage profession, and was at its most popular during time periods of ancient Egypt where women were restricted from going out when married. These vendors would roam neighborhoods with buckets and baskets of product for sale. Clothing, perfume, fabric, snacks. Now, what was unusual is that the vendor was more often women than men. Walking the streets alone, making these sales because many married women weren't allowed to go out walking the streets alone to make sales. You see the irony. Anyways, this profession found great popularity in single women, and many also were called upon to act as nurses in homes of the wealthy when needed. The career is named Al Dalala, but the idea itself has long been extinct with the freedom for Egyptian women to roam commercial districts. Number eight is being a dancer. Ancient Egyptians loved their music and dance. They were celebratory, but also ritualistic at times. Farmers would dance to thank the gods for a good harvest. Dance groups would perform at banquets. People would go dance around the Nile in the lush season. The list goes on. Many Many men and women chose dance as a career, and it was a highly respected one. Dancing was considered an acceptable and normal part of life and even important to it. Most festivals were incomplete without it. In fact, dancing was such a revered career that dancers could start as a peasant and become a high status person from it. Just like being a celebrity in the way that people would go to see them perform. Women at the time were even more revered for their grace, elegance, and acrobatics. This career had seven types of dance. Gymnastic, movement, pair dancing, imitative dance, which was like acting like animals, group dances, like a historic cheerleading squad, dramatic dance was female exclusive and rested in illustration, war dances, grotesque dance, and then religious chant dances at temples, and lyrical dance, which was usually a depiction of lovers. At number seven, the ancient hub. Back in ancient times, people needed some spicy content to make themselves happy, you know? Before we had only fans and the hub, people in ancient Egypt had their own adult content to enjoy during their alone time. This piece of content was called the Turin Papyrus, and it was essentially just a scroll of a bunch of images on it with people getting busy in some frankly unimaginable positions. Like, I don't know when the Kama Sutra was created, but I feel like the Turin Papyrus certainly gave it a run for its money. The purpose of this papyrus is pretty much unknown, but there are some theories to explain its origin and why it was created, some thinking that it had political ties or something. Either way, historians use this document to further understand times in ancient Egypt. At number six, magic attraction. You know, we can't always have the best game when it comes to finding a partner. Sometimes it can be hard to get someone to go out with you. Many people just don't give up until they succeed, and sometimes that means that they will go to many lengths just to get a date with their crush. This was seen a lot in ancient Egypt, and at one point in later years of their civilization, they practiced magic to attract the one that they loved. Turns out that they practiced voodoo to get someone interested in them, and it was commonly done by men seeking out the woman of their dreams. In one case of this voodoo for love practice, a man had a magician make a voodoo doll of a woman that he wanted all to himself. The magician pierced the figurine with bronze nails and inscribed a tablet on it with a spell saying that this woman would not be able to drink, eat, or be with another man besides the one seeking her out. The spell also supposedly summoned a demon to follow her and pull her hair and intestines until she found her way to him. Sounds a little intense, but hey, I guess that's just what you do when you don't have Tinder. At number five, sneaky link. In ancient Egyptian literature, women were often portrayed as seductresses. One of the more famous stories telling the tale of a seductress is one called the tale of the two brothers. 
Essentially, the story goes that a man, his wife, and his younger brother all lived together. One day, the two men went out to do some farm work, and while they were out, the one man told his brother to go back to the house to get some grain sacks. When he reached the house, the wife noticed the brother and complimented him on his strength and tried to seduce him. The brother got angry and refused, but told the wife that he wouldn't say anything to her husband about their encounter. Still, she was worried that the brother would snitch, and so she made herself look like she had been beaten up, and when her husband returned, she pretended like the brother was the one who tried to seduce her. The husband got angry and threatened to kill his brother, but in an attempt to save his own skin, the brother told the husband the truth and even cut his bits off and threw his pee pee into the river just to prove his point, where it was promptly eaten by fish. Unfortunate. The husband then returned home to his wife, where he killed her and fed her to dogs. Not a happy ending for anyone, but it gives you a real sense of how adultery worked back in those days. At number 4, no Viagra. Just like anyone else these days, back in ancient Egypt, sometimes people had performance issues. Impotence was apparently a really big issue for many Egyptian men. It was such a common issue that sometimes it infiltrated their art and there were some scrolls and statues about it. An ancient Egyptian proverb was created about such a topic that said, quote, He who is shy to have intercourse with his wife will not get any children. Now obviously, there are things nowadays that can help with such an issue, but back then, people resulted to prayer and magic to help their little buddies out. Don't really know how well that worked out for them, but it's a struggle that a lot of people face, so at least they weren't alone. At number 3, LGBTQ+. As with anywhere on earth, there were same sex relationships, and the same goes for ancient Egypt. However, documentation of such things were far and few. The only 100% clear cut case of same sex relationships that was documented in ancient Egypt comes from the story of Horus and Seth. The story goes that Horus and Seth were both vying for the throne, and one night, Horus pretended to be drunk while Seth tried to take advantage of him while Horus slept. Not the greatest example, but it's what we've got that's actually confirmed. Another potential recorded gay relationship may have come from Egypt's King Pepu II, who was thought to have had a secret relationship with one of his generals at nighttime. One of the most well known potential gay relationships from those times, though, comes from a piece of Egyptian art that showed two men touching noses. Doesn't seem like anything too intimate, but back then, touching noses was another way of kissing. The two men depicted, though, were thought to be brothers, so it's theorized that there was something a little spicy going on there, but we don't have to think about that one too hard. At number two, dirty insults. What is your favorite insult? Don't be shy, you can tell me, this is a safe space. I guess I have a number of favorites, but one that I quite enjoy is saying that someone's mother is a horker, like in Skyrim. Back in the times of ancient Egypt, however, insults often included some kind of note. If they needed to hurl an insult at someone, they might say something like, quote, may you copulate with a donkey, or may a donkey copulate with your wife. People would also combine some kind of note with pointing out someone's flaws to create an insult. In a note found from one of the people who built one of the great pyramids, they insulted one of their co-builders by saying, quote, you are not a man because you cannot get your wives pregnant like your fellow men. Like, damn, that's pretty cold, dude. And finally, at number one, the magic pee pee. <laughs> Now, I had to save this next fact for our number one spot because it's probably one of the most bizarre things that I've ever learned about ancient Egypt. The Egyptian god Min was the male fertility god, and let's just say that he was quite unique. He was known for his bold feathered headdress and the fact that his loincloth snake was always being charmed, if you get what I'm saying. Men suffering from impotence would make offerings to him to help them with their fertility problems. Even to this day, figures of the god Min are used in magic rites. Men and women still visit the ancient temples to find figures of the god and literally rub his to overcome their problems. Sounds strange, but apparently so many people have done it that the stone that it's carved into has become worn down or darkened from how many hands have touched it. Now I can only imagine what this god's body count was. At number 10, brotherly love. There were some weird things happening between the gods in Egyptian mythology, as we will come to learn through this video. To get us started on this journey through the strangest of stories, let's talk about some serious closeness between the gods Osiris and Isis. These two gods were husband and wife, but they were also brother and sister. Yeah, it's weird, but they were gods, so I guess it was fine. These two ruled Egypt until their other brother, Set, killed Osiris. 
when her husband died, Isis went on a search to find Osiris' body because she just really wanted to have a child with him and just wasn't going to let pesky old death get in her way. When she found Osiris' remains, she was able to resurrect him for long enough for them to conceive a child. However, that process was a little difficult because she wasn't able to get the most important part of him for that because a fish had apparently eaten his member. Again, Isis was a very resilient woman, and quite crafty too because she just crafted him a new device, if you will, and they went on to produce a son, Horus, who would later become the new king of Egypt. This story is a little weird, don't get me wrong, but it's also a story of perseverance, I guess, so maybe it's not all bad. Hi number 9, Trophies. I know a lot of people like to save little mementos and souvenirs from things that meant a lot to them in life. People save movie stubs from their first date with someone, little objects from their childhoods, and a whole collection of other things saved from different points of their lives. There was an Egyptian god who sort of did the same thing, but a little creepier. Well, actually it was a lot creepier. The god Anubis was the god of mummification, and I guess you could say that he just really liked his job. He was part of the embalming process for some big names like Osiris. See, tying it back to the previous story when the god Set killed his brother Osiris, he got pretty buddy buddy with Anubis because he offered Osiris' organs to the god of mummification. But not for Anubis since he was known to collect pieces of the remains of people that he had embalmed. He had a thing for limbs and other remains, I guess. It was a weird collection to have, that's for sure, but for the god of mummification, it almost seems fitting. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things that Egyptian gods did in their mythology, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, maybe consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, The Last Snack. For the Egyptians, a person's burial and their soul's final journey was a very big deal. We are probably all familiar with the mummification practices of the ancient Egyptians and all that, but what comes after was also pretty interesting. When someone died, it was believed that their soul would then move on to be judged. The soul would leave their body and go to the underworld searching for the Hall of Truth. Once they found it, they would then be judged on who they were in their life, and if they passed the test, then they got to go to paradise. But if they failed, then they became a nice little snack for the goddess Emmet. Amit was known as a demon goddess and dubbed the devourer of Amenti. When the deceased was tested and their heart was weighed against a feather, if they failed that test, then Amit would eat the person's essence and they would vanish for eternity. Obviously, you wouldn't want that to happen, so I guess this was just an incentive for Egyptians to live life as a good person. Wig makers are number seven. Egyptians loved wigs for a reason that surprises many. It helped keep their heads cool. I mean, it also helped with hygiene and scalp pests and looking pretty, but the heat thing is what really gets folks. Many Egyptians had shaved or cropped hair, and the mesh-like base of a wig versus a headscarf allowed the body heat to still escape. And as said, wigs were also a great shield from lice or other invasive bugs. The hair used in the construction of wigs and hair extensions was always human and was either an individual's own hair or had been traded or bought. Hair itself was a valuable commodity ranked alongside gold and incense in a count list from the town of Cahoon, which puts emphasis on the popularity of wigs. When hair was collected for a wig, it was thoroughly combed and then sorted into lengths individually. The Egyptians invented a variety of hairdressing tools and the wig makers would take the time to braid or coil the hair depending on the wig style, coating each with warm beeswax and resin fixative so that it would harden when cool. The job itself isn't unusual, more so the booming industry it had. Wigs weren't worn to this extent anywhere else at the time, and while yes they were functional against the sun, they were more so aesthetic than anything. Individual braid and extensions could also be attached to someone's scalp for aesthetics, the way that box braids, twists, faux locks, and many other ethnic hairstyles are accomplished today. Wigs were made in a type of factory setting. Archaeologists have uncovered the remain of wig factories, wig boxes have been found in tombs, and multiple mummies have been found with wigs or braided in extensions. Number six, we meet our ladies of the night. Unlike most ancient and even modern civilizations, selling intercourse is illegal or was highly governed. In ancient Egypt, this wasn't even close to the case, but rather the opposite in a peculiar way. Women who worked in the sexual industries were considered divine and respectable, as their career was considered to please the gods. They earned high status and lived in luxury. Working freely and openly, these ladies adorned themselves with red lipstick and eye makeup that differentiated themselves from other women. They were also tattooed, diamond shaped dots along the thighs and on the fingers or images 
of the god Bess. When the French invaded, they brought STIs, and they spread rapidly through the brothels, and this prompted the French authorities to introduce a law forbidding French troops from entering the brothels or having these ladies in their rooms. Guess those ladies were hard to resist because anyone who offended the law received death penalty. Number 5 are the wet nurses. Wet nurses are found in all statuses and were for all statuses. One common denominator though is that the career kind of really sucked, pun intended. So first their social status was always determined by the status of who they were breastfeeding. Royal family, congrats on your special privileges, statues, private quarters, and your own tomb in the family pyramid. Also her family would receive special perks as an extension of her. Now royal families only wanted high status wet nurses and while it's not clear how they were chosen, evidence suggests some kind of blood tie or faint familiar relation. Most wet nurses were from marginalized families in lower socioeconomic statuses and worked under conditions and pre-definitive wages. Wet nurse requirements for any status were intense. She'd have to have given birth at least twice, have a large but healthy body due to the belief that large bodies were more nourishing. Despite that, her breasts should be medium. Too small, not enough food. Too big, the baby's spoiled. In addition to all of these prerequisites, the wet nurse should be sweet-tempered, affectionate, and responsive to her charge. She should also abstain from intercourse because it could reduce her affection towards a child, and they also said no alcohol. A good call knowing what we know now. Wet nurses were women exploited for the products of their bodies. As slaves, they were coerced for their milk. As lower social status women, they were employed for their bodies to enhance their inadequate domestic status. Even her own household suffered physically and monetarily if a wet nurse defaulted or failed a contract. On the same page, surrogates are number four. This is a widespread practice in Egypt. The first story of surrogacy found in Genesis 16 of the Bible was the story of infertile Sarah having Egyptian Hagar carry her child for her and her husband Abraham. Even Egyptian pharaohs had used concubines to produce heirs. They often married their sisters or aunts, and children born of these marriages were most of the time not in great or functional health and wouldn't survive. Any child born of a concubine for a pharaoh was accepted as his lawful offspring. Now, they were quite limited in their rights and they could only inherit the throne in case of the absence of another more entitled heir. Surrogates experienced similar contracts and status leveling as wet nurses. They were desired to be mothers already, have a bigger, healthier body, and naturally beauty was a desired element as well. Women of low status who made a career of surrogacy often died in childbirth or from hemorrhages due to the repetitive birthing process, but for some, it was the only career they could have. Priestress is number three, and so while it was a male-dominated field, many women were employed as a priestress or a high priestress at the temples around Egypt. Mostly from upper status, many were married to the priests, which they owed their position in society. Despite this, they played roles in the temple rituals, such as servicing goddesses Hathor, Neith, and Paket, or working as dancers, musicians, singers, and acrobats in the temple. The most important priestress was known as the god's wife Amun. This woman was usually the daughter of the pharaoh or sometimes his wife. She usually held a very high position in court and performed important rituals to honor the god Amun. The priestress was in charge of managing the gods' affairs, attending to ritual dances and performances, shaking their rattles and rattling their necklaces, which were long and heavily beaded objects. By the beginning of the New Kingdom in 1550, the title Chantress of Amun was used, and it was usually the wives of the priests who gained these elevated positions as well. The concept of a woman as a priest was unheard of in many kingdoms. A high priestress and the reverence and traditions of female gods being led by women were unusual to outsiders of Egypt who oftentimes restricted most priestly activities to just men. Number two is professional mourners. Okay, so here's a weird one. Professional or paid mourning is an occupation not only found in Egypt, but in China, the Mediterranean, and Eastern Europe. This practice is literally paying a stranger to attend a funeral to lament, deliver a eulogy, help comfort the family, entertain, or lay on the ground wailing. There's some range here, depends on what kind of funeral you want to have. These paid mourners made ostentatious displays, messy hair and smudged makeup, wailing, pounding on the ground or their chest, throwing themselves about as they smear dirt and sand all over their body while they screamed. It's a full spectacle. Now, another depiction of the paid mourners in Egypt is a little more chill. Two women impersonating the goddesses Isis and Nephthys. They were believed to play a special role in someone's death. Most inscriptions of a funeral where they are present as paid mourners, they are on each side of the corpse and their bodies are fully shaved. These women also had to be childless and have a tattoo of either Isis or Nephthys' name 
on their shoulder. Most evidence of professional mourning is seen in pyramids and tomb inscriptions, such as women holding their bodies dramatically in sorrow, braced over a casket with tears flowing. If you were a theater kid, this was definitely the type of job for you. And number one, it's the female physician. Egypt is a difficult one with historians. There's been a lot of largely ignored discoveries due to the opinions of those who found them. The evidence of women in ancient Egyptian medical fields is part of that because as it turns out, their physicians were actually primarily women. Evidence shows women in the medical profession going back into early dynastic period Egypt when Marit Ptah was the royal court's chief physician in 2700 BCE. She was the first female doctor known in world history, but there is another unnamed female physician who is listed to be the head of the Temple Neith Medical School in 3000 BCE, so maybe not. But either way, the first female doctor was in ancient Egypt. Women were highly respected throughout Egypt's history and many of their goddesses represented facets of health. Neith has been associated with the invention of birth and Hathor represents fertility. Four deities associated with healing are Heka, Sekhmet, Serket and Nephritim, which are all female. So, bizarre claims you may have heard that no women are involved in Egyptian medicine don't accord with the values of their civilization, which were incredibly equitable. By this reasoning, there were no women involved in anything of no anywhere in the world until the modern era, because history books make no mention of their contributions. But it's all up to say. Number 10 Grave Robbing. Probably the most infamous crime of the time and today, really. The ancient Egyptians were many things, and that included Vain. There's a reason why they got Elizabeth Taylor to play Cleopatra. It all makes sense. The pharaohs of Egypt were buried with immeasurable amounts of treasures gold, gems, jewels, swords, cats, dogs, just about everything but the kitchen sink. Once the tombs were sealed, the treasure was also sealed in there forever, or so they thought. That was until some crafty thieves broke into the tombs and slipped away with the loot. When a lot of Egypt was being discovered in the 1920s, it was unsure if the loot had been taken 10 years ago or 1,000 years ago. There's not really a way to know. And yes, it still happens to this day, and yes, it's awful. Leave it in there, it belongs to them, please. No more, no, no loot, Tim. Don't go loot, Tim, please. Number 9 Bribery Given that Egypt was one of the greatest civilizations the ancient world ever saw, it makes sense that they had it all. Currency, law, order. However, sometimes. Well, sometimes these things just don't mix. Ever seen Better Call Saul? Yeah, exactly. They had a good system for the time and it was fairly concrete. However, like concrete over time, there's little tiny cracks that form, aka bribery. Oftentimes when facing serious charges against the pharaoh, there was an option to opt out of your sentence, just open your wallet and dish out some cash. This has worked in ancient Egypt, medieval Europe, 1920s America, and today. Say what you will, but the almighty dollar does have buying power. Number 8. Unaliving. If women of the evening partake in the world's oldest profession every night, then unaliving is the second thing we ever did. It's not really a profession, but it's we've been doing it for a long time. It's pretty sad, but it's true. Sure, it's always been frowned upon, but today we have a lot of rules, laws, and regulations regarding said rules, laws, and regulations about unaliving. It's bad. Don't do it. It was unfortunately more common than we think back in the day, especially amongst royals in ancient Egypt frothing at the mouth for the throne. But this is something that could have happened to anyone. Plus, in a time before CSI and guys throwing off their glasses to make very obvious low-hanging fruit jokes, well, if you didn't see the crime, then you probably wouldn't catch the crook. So people kind of just got away with it sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. At right, number seven, down the Nile. Now I know that I've mentioned the story of Set and Osiris a couple times now, but their story is just so messed up and weird that I have to keep including the best parts of it. Anyways, we all know that Set overthrew his brother Osiris as a king of Egypt and did so by killing him, but let's talk about exactly how that happened. Set was a really jealous guy and he resented his brother for being king, so he devised a plan to trick his brother into a coffin. Set had a coffin designed exactly for Osiris' measurements and while at a party, Set challenged Osiris to get in it as he promised that he would give the coffin as a gift to anyone who could fit inside it. So yeah, it was rigged from the start. So Osiris gets inside and obviously it was a perfect fit. What he didn't know though was that this was where he would remain forever because Set sealed his brother in the coffin and sent it down the Nile River. After that, Osiris' wife slash sister Isis went to go find him and blah blah blah, we already know what happens next. At number 6, Lady of Plagues. Guys, if you haven't already clued in, we're still in a panorama, a panzerati. 
a pandemic. It seems like it'll never end, and after learning about the Egyptian goddess Sekhmet, I think I know why we're all going through this. It's because someone pissed her off big time. Sekhmet was known as the Lady of Terror, and if you don't get a good sense as to who she was just by her name, just you wait. This goddess had the ability to spread pestilence and plague against anyone who remotely angered her. So judging by that, I think if you believe in this kind of thing, someone has some serious apologizing to do. Because of this insane power, Egyptians were brought up to know that they had to stay on Sekhmet's good side, otherwise they would be risking the health and safety of themselves and those around them. So this is a PSA to whoever made Sekhmet so mad. Please go apologize. Buy her some flowers, make a sacrifice or two if you have to. Please just make her stop. It's literally my birthday today and all I want to do is live out my 20s in peace. Please, just do it for me. At number five, kitty love. We all know that the Egyptians loved cats. Why? I don't know. I honestly can't see why you would worship those angry little fur devils, but hey, to each their own, I guess. The Egyptians even had their own goddess for cats called Bastet, and though you might think that she was just some crazy cat lady goddess, you would be very, very wrong. Bastet had a dark side to her and was known as the Lady of Dread or the Lady of Slaughter. Kind of fitting for a name for a cat goddess since they are also evil to their core. She was known to kill other gods like the god Apophis, whom she slaughtered by cutting off his head. Regardless of her dark past though, the Egyptians still worshipped her and many even worshipped her by bringing her offerings of mummified cats to her temple. Cats bring out the darkness in people, I'm telling you. At number 4, Boozy Blood. Sometimes we make bad decisions when we're emotional. Like those times that people punch walls when they're really mad and totally regret it afterwards. Well, even though they were deities, sometimes the Egyptian gods would do some regrettable things too. Ra the sun god had a mighty temper and was known to make some pretty rash decisions. At one point, Ra decided that he wanted everyone to just die, and so he instructed his daughter Hathor to slaughter all the humans that she could find. Hathor was totally on the same page and was like, okay, bet, and went off to kill some humans. Luckily for humanity though, Ra came to his senses and had a change of heart, but by the time he caught up to Hathor, she became so bloodthirsty that there was no stopping her. So in an attempt to trick her into stopping her killing conquest, Ra filled 7,000 jars with beer and gave it to Hathor, who then became so drunk that she just gave up on her mission and decided not to kill everyone. Now they say that alcohol can't solve all your problems, but in this case it certainly did. At number three, creation. There are so many creation stories out there created by various religions and civilizations. One of the more bizarre creation stories however belongs to the ancient Egyptians because their first god did something a little weird to create life as we know it. These ancient people believed that their very first god Atum created himself and as such he had no wife and literally no one else to potentially procreate with and so to create his children and thus create humanity he pumped the hose and released humanity if you get what I'm saying here. If not you're too young to be here. Anyways, out of his pleasurable process, he created his kids Shu and Tefnut. This legend also created the term the god's hand and was used to refer to women back in ancient Egypt, since Atum's hand played the quote unquote female role in the creation of his offspring. But yeah, I guess you could say that Atum was very pleased with what he created. At number two, giant snake. There were a lot of strange animals in Egyptian mythology, one of them being a giant snake. The Egyptian god Apep was a giant snake who had some serious snake beef with their sun god Ra. They were polar opposites, Ra being the light, literally, and Apep representing darkness, chaos, and evil. One day, Apep just seemed to have had enough with Ra and all of his sunshine goodness and positive vibes and just swallowed him up. He gobbled up Ra and the sun, leaving the world in complete darkness. Luckily, the other gods were there to save the day and they had to slice Apep's belly open to free Ra and restore light to the world. This evil danger noodle lost this battle, but at least he got a taste of that spicy meatball in the sky. And finally, at number one, a hearty meal. There are two sides to every person. Some people are nice on the surface, but they have a dark core that they keep hidden from the world. And the same could sort of be said for the Egyptian god Khonsu. You see, the gods were seen as helpful, but people also feared them, for good reason. I mean, these guys could pack a punch, and Khonsu was one of those guys with a serious dark side. Khonsu was the god of the moon, and was also seen as the god of healing. Sounds super positive and all, however, he was also known to eat people's hearts. Yeah, 
Human hearts were a choice snack of his, but he was also known to dine on the hearts of select gods as well. He definitely isn't the guy to mess with because you might become his next hearty meal. Number 10, punishment first. Innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, right? That's that's how it goes. How do you know I drank the milk? <laughs> There's no milk on my face. How do you know? There, there'd probably be milk on my face. Not so much in ancient Egypt. While there is some evidence of jails existing, it is clear that they much preferred an immediate and swift justice. By that, I mean flogging, mutilation, removing limbs, uh, that sort of thing. A lot of these punishments were overseen by a vizier. In today's terms, it's sort of like a governor or official who had the power to oversee things like punishment through. Or at least held the most power besides the pharaoh, which, hey, that's a lot of power. While it may be an effective system for keeping prisons empty, no one should lose fingers for sliding a couple double bubbles in their pocket. That's just my opinion. Number 9. Prisoners while the promise of losing a limb the second you're caught taking a cookie from the cookie jar, boy I've been there, is a great deterrent, prison can also work sometimes. It should be noted that Egypt developed a system of law and order 4,000 years ago, which is, well, a long time ago and very impressive. For anyone taking the bar exam, that should be your answer under why take on law. Because the Egyptians did it first, why not? They did it, it's probably cool. So it makes sense that they did have some prisons. There's depictions of prisoners and drawings and figurines, surprisingly, oftentimes having their arms bound to their back like a good episode of Cops. And a leash around their neck with ropes and uh, well, it just looks a little strange and weird. Given that most criminals were done on the spot, it's not hard to imagine that the Egyptians were cruel to their prisoners, and they were, it was not good. They should be canceled, that's what should be canceled, them. Number eight, court. Believe it or not, they also had some sort of makeshift court as well. Who would have thought? No hammer and gavel, and certainly no Saul Goodman or Judge Judy, but hey, without those, I'd argue what the heck's the point of the American justice system in the first place, right? Ah, oh boy. But they were simple processes, to say the least. During the Middle Kingdom period, judges were appointed to decide on verdicts before well, it was usually priests, so I, I, I prefer a judge doing that, honestly. Except in this court, no one is legally represented by anyone. Yeah, that's right. There's no lawyers, but there was a jury and there were witnesses. Unfortunately, they were often beaten until, well, they said the truth or uh, the desired truth. Number seven, assassination. Related to my last point, nothing is true, everything is permitted. The creed of the assassins in one of my favorite video game franchises, at least up until they did pirates. After that, it's, I was all kind of downhill after that. Well, despite the inaccuracies of the Assassin's Creed series has, like falling from great heights into bales of hay, the first known assassins just may have started in Rome and Egypt. More likely Egypt than spread to Rome, actually. Like a Sith, a lot of these early assassinations were for revenge, personal ambition, power lust, especially in the pursuit of success. Some were even part of larger plans. Now, it's one thing to be violent, sure, but to organize the destruction of a dynasty through the means of your knife? Well, it's amazing what a couple inches of steel can accomplish. Who goes there? Someone's knocking on the door. We're good, okay, anyway, sorry. Number six, treason. Law and order in Egypt were associated with something called mahat. I believe that's how you say it, which refers to truth and justice within society. Like I said before, great idea, great start, but more often than not, the ancient Egyptians had to fight off a lot of treason and corruption, uh, more than they like to admit it. Like when King Ramses III chose the heir to his throne, and uh, well, it wasn't who his wife had picked out, so there was going to be problems. There was a lot of wives, sons, and, and breeding, there's, con there's confusing lines. So in order to get what she wanted, she was going to stab him in the back. Literally. Well, her plot was unfoiled, and her and all the conspirators were immediately unalived as punishment. There wasn't even a burial service, as they were all thrown in the river afterwards. No amount of money or bribery could save them there. Number five, thigh or leg. Ever sit down at the holiday dinner table and your uncle's cutting the turkey and says, Are you a thigh man or are you a leg man? <laughs> Except he says the same thing every Christmas and you can't wait for him to say it because that means you're another second closer to not being there. Anxiety is a heck of a thing, man. I don't have anxiety that bad. I'm just trying to relate to some of the people out there. I feel like I've been there with you. I don't know. Well, this was no Christmas and this certainly was no turkey, but people were talking about here. Yeah, we're talking about people. When someone was found to have done a serious enough crime, but not serious enough to be unalived, the authorities met in the middle by taking a leg. Oh God, that's awful. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I guess it's not that bad. You, you lose a leg and you move on, but imagine being held down and someone hacking your leg off. 
with a bronze tool because steel doesn't exist yet. Oh, it's awful, awful, no good, no painkillers. Number four, homework. Homework, 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 homework. Love it or hate it. Well, I actually hate it, and so did most of my friends. Some say it's needed in a modern world to teach efficiently. Some argue it doesn't do anything at all. I did my homework 90% of the time, believe it or not. And I know some, some of you are gonna comment and say, oh, Chetty, no you didn't. I did, I really did. But when I didn't, I would usually come in and charm my way out of it. Hi, Mrs. Middleton, you look great today. You're the best. It worked most of the time, what can I say? Usually on the, usually on the female teachers, it didn't work on the male teachers so. though. But the worst that would have happened is that I would lose a percent off my grade here or there, but I just make it up back on the test, no problem. Well, scribes in ancient Egypt weren't so lucky. They were very important as they were literally the writers of the time. They, they described the history, it's pretty cool actually. However, if they chose to stay up all night and play Call of Duty like I did, well, their punishment was a more of the violent physical variety and not so much the stern talking to or I'm going to phone your mother variety. My mom didn't care. Number three, caning. Another creative punishment for crimes was caning of the feet, which is actually arguably the worst thing on this list. Since, you know, we use feet every time we walk or do something, you're gonna need spot treatment after this one. A very simple process, the person is strapped down, feet exposed, a governing official then takes as many lashes to the feet as required. Painful, humiliating, and possibly dangerous. Cuts could lead to infection as we're walking around in heat, sweat, and well, some folks, if you're poor enough, just didn't have shoes. The worst I ever got was a couple minutes on the timeout corner, except that my mom felt bad because I looked really cute and I was sad and everything was fine. No spanking required. I was a good boy, I promise. The film people don't think I was a good boy, but I really was a good boy. Number two, barbecue. I feel like the moment humans discovered fire, well, that fire hurts, we wanted to throw everything in it and see what happens. Now, I jokingly call this segment barbecue, but that's because it's really horrible. Famously, a group of rebels in ancient Egypt were immolated after trying to overthrow the pharaoh. Where after the barbecue from hell had finished, the pharaoh used these rebels as human torches. I, that's, oh, wow, okay. All Fantastic Four jokes aside, it was horrible, smelly, and cruel. Don't ever do this, please. Number one, adultery. Surprisingly, one of the most punishable crimes in ancient Egypt was being unfaithful, partly related to the lifestyle of Mahat and being truthful and just. It really makes sense, just be a good boy. It makes a lot of sense, but some people don't follow that. The whole thing is bizarre because, well, no one really followed it, especially the royals. I mean, they had kids with their sisters and brothers and cousins and, and others and all, uh, just, it's messy. However, some folks did find themselves caught in this law and when they did, they could succumb to anything on this list. For women, it was most likely the torch. For men, it was impalement and then being tossed into the river because, you know. Better keep those love notes to yourself, folks. Not worth getting burned over. It's it's not worth it. Just keep these off. Number 10, surgical souvenirs. You ever go on a trip and you bring back a shell home with you, right? It's pretty cute. A little piece of the ocean to remind you of that time that you got food poisoning in Cancun, right? Love it. Put it on a shelf, hashtag memories. Well, Anubis, the Egyptian god of mummification, he had a similar hobby, it seems. Anubis historically oversaw the embalming process during mummification, which on one hand is probably Probably a pretty sweet job. But Anubis, this ancient wonder that he is, he kept trophies from those that he embalmed. So word spread quickly, Anubis likes body parts, pass it on. And so in turn, for centuries, ancient Egyptians offered pieces of lifeless bodies to Anubis. Yeah, here you go. Hey, anybody want this arm? Here you go, nice catch. Whoever gave him the jackal head, great call. He's a big fan of that. He likes to rock that one every single day. Real ominous and terrifying looking, that jackal head. Number nine. The Devourer. I love the name. Right off the hop, The Devourer, right? Straight to the point. Nobody celebrated the end of days like ancient Egyptians. They celebrated death, for death was not the end. Egyptians would often engage in rituals for those who had passed. Of course, explaining mummification, but ideally after this point, historically, your soul would then make its way to the afterlife and search for the hall of truth. Ancient souls have to pass a final test, but if you fail, if your soul fails, well, buddy, I got some bad news for you. Or rather, the Devourer over there has some bad news for you. Yeah, the Devourer of Amenti, aka Amit. I mean, visually, she is terrifying. Amit has a crocodile's head, a hippo's body, and lion paws to keep you sweating 
and at bay. Number eight, the final exam. So say you want to avoid meeting the devourer of a mentee. Okay, what's the game plan here? What's this final exam that you have to pass? Is it high jump? If it's high jump, I might be okay. Maybe, depends, you know, on a good day. This final test placed the heart of the recently deceased on a scale. Being a Libra, I actually love this. Your heart was weighed against a white feather, which represented balance. Now, if there was unbalance, a mitt would then eat your entire existence. So yeah, you best behave. Hit that thumbs up or else, you know, you know. Number seven, police. Bad boys, bad boys. What are you gonna do? Yes, that's right. Ancient Egypt may have had the first police force in history. Who would have thought? I actually didn't know that. I mean, sure, the vizier is great and all, but he can't possibly go around arresting everyone. He'd be at this all day. He can't do that. So it's only natural that you hire a bunch of dudes to do it for you. Can't get them all, but you can get some of them. While they did provide some limited support to communities and crime in towns, most of their arrests were made against those who were a little too greedy and thought grave robbing, well, the many sacred tombs around would make for an easy payday. It didn't. Number six, Bloodhounds and Baboons. That's a weird title. This one is so weird, but okay, here we go. We've all seen the movies where there's a crook, a perp, or someone who's trying to outrun the law. Andy Dufresne was right. You gotta crawl through a lot if you want your freedom. I remember Andy Dufresne. Anyway, well, in these scenes, there was a good chance that law enforcement has dogs with them. Oh, yeah, see, I'm getting somewhere with this. There's also a good chance that those dogs were bloodhounds. Cute dogs, actually, but the reason they bring them along is because they have a great nose. They can sniff a scent and follow it for miles, oftentimes leading to the crook. Smart dogs. What if I told you though that this sort of thing existed in ancient Egypt, except that it wasn't dogs, it was baboons. Yeah, who would have thought? Yes, that's right. There's depictions of police with baboons assisting in the work with crooks and or criminals. It's all jokes until Diddy Kong shows up to arrest you. Now it's DK time, baby. Uh-oh. Number five, get to work. Also, speaking of movies, you know that classic scene where the prisoners are out on work duty, everyone's in their like orange jumpsuits, they're cleaning up all the garbage? Okay, that, but ancient. A lot of criminals, thieves, and no good rotten folks were used for hard manual labor. Pretty classic. And you guessed it, building the pyramids. While the pyramids are often misconceived of being built by YouTube's least favorite S-word, it was most likely built by a combination of people, mostly crafted skillsmen and builders, followed by crooks and those wishing to get out of the hot, hot sun. The job was dangerous, hot, like I said, and oftentimes heavy lifting, too much for me. While normal workers were granted two days off a year because it is backbreaking work, the criminals were tasked with quarrying stone with no no days off, no machines, no iron tools. I mean, it's all, oh man, that must be awful. Just the horror. <laughs> just, just, just the worst. Number four, tarnished reputation. This one actually makes a lot of sense, really. Depending on how heinous the crime is, you wouldn't want this for stealing some bubble gum. So if you found yourself in hot trouble or the principal's office, which I was never in for being a bad boy, I was good every single time, I promise. No one believes me still, but I, I was. The vizier or government would keep track of who's been sneaking in the tombs like Laura Croft. Hence, they could use this information to tarnish your reputation. It was also used against false witnesses and those wishing to gain something from a legal situation. Those that wish to bear false witness would immediately have something amputated because that's the law around here, partner. Number three, Fair Pharaoh. The great Pharaoh Bacchus is an interesting subject to say the least. First off, I had to say his name a couple times before I really understood what was going on there. I blame dyslexia, but that's just how it goes, baby. But secondly, he's the guy that takes power and goes, whoa, 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 guys, maybe not so harsh. And I use this term lightly, but he improved human rights, specifically improvements for prisoners who owe debt. Hmm, sounds like someone might have owed someone a few bucks himself, hmm. Interestingly enough, his laws were influenced by Greek laws, who then influenced more Greek laws, who those Greek laws influenced Roman laws, who then influenced our modern law. There's a, there's a big chain of events there. Trust me, it all matches up. Number two, your nose knows. Knows to stay out of trouble. I saved this one for the bottom of the list because, well, it's just so awful and weird. In a town called Rhinocolora, not too far from Cairo, but 200 miles, was a town full of people with no noses. What? I know. 
This wasn't a Red Skull Comic Con convention, but a penal colony of sorts. Maybe the first. These people were or had been accused of thievery, and for this, they had their noses removed to show anyone who visited what kind of people they really were. In a world of infection and disease, I cannot recommend this. It's not a good idea. You, you probably wouldn't make it after they removed it. The name Rhino Cholera, which literally translates to Clip Nose, the town of Clip Nose. That's that's not good. Number one in God's hands. Remember before I mentioned the priests used to handle verdicts? Well, it's crazier than you might think, actually. While the Pharaoh was top dog in ancient Egypt, and I mean he was top dog, you don't, you don't get past the Pharaoh, the gods controlled everything and the Egyptians worshipped their gods. Crops, weather, justice, I mean they did everything. So oftentimes the priest verdicts would come down from the gods themselves. If that wasn't enough, the god Mahis was responsible for those criminals in the afterlife where they would also receive comeuppance. Uh oh, you're not safe anywhere. A sort of jail in the sky if you will. Alcatraz has nothing on that. You're bad here, you're bad in the sky, you're bad everywhere, bad in the afterlife. So that's why folks, you behave yourselves. Keep your nose, behave yourself. Number 10, drowning. Drowning as a form of punishment was not a common practice in ancient Egypt, at least as far as historical records and archeological evidence indicate. The ancient Egyptians had a legal system with various forms of punishment, but the various methods were typically less severe than drowning. But in records of the code of Hammurabi, which was one of the oldest and known legal codes in human history, it provided a comprehensive set of laws covering a wide range of aspects of daily life including civil, criminal, and commercial matters. One of the most famous aspects of the cold is the principle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, which laid out specific punishments for various offenses. Mentioning drowning if there was adultery with a neighbor's wife or if you had intimate relations with your daughter-in-law, more or less these punishments would go both ways, but interestingly enough, the laws depended on the person. Number 9. Disinheritance in ancient Egypt, inheritance and property rights were complex and evolved over time, with some variations depending on the specific period and social status of individuals. Generally, women did have rights to inherit property, but there was significant differences between men and women in terms of inheritance. During the early dynastic periods, women had relatively more rights and they could inherit and own property. However, as the society became more stratified and centralized with the rise of the pharaonic state, inheritance laws became in favor more for males. By the time of the Middle Kingdom, women's rights to property and inheritance were gradually eroded. Property, especially land, was usually passed from father to son. Women could gain property through marriage contracts, dowries, or gifts, which they could then pass on to their children. But if they lose their inheritance, so do their children. Thankfully, there was legitimate ways of structuring a will, making unequal distributions of disinheriting a person so to minimize challenges which do not involve corporal punishment. These include a gift conditional upon the recipient, not challenging the will, a no contest clause, diverting assets outside the will by writing a life insurance policy, and to trust or passing assets through the will to a secret trust. Number 8. Banishment in ancient Egypt, as in many ancient societies, the legal system was complex and the punishment for various offenses could vary depending on factors such as the severity of the crime, the societal status of an individual involved, and the time period in question. Banishment was one possible punishment, but it was not the common form of punishment. Banishment in ancient Egypt was being expelled from a community or city was generally used for serious offenses or crimes. It was a severe punishment because it meant the individual was cut off from their community and likely left to fend for themselves in the harsh environment outside settled areas. And for women, it was typically a rare occurrence as the legal system in ancient Egypt was based on the code of law that changed over time, and evidence suggests that women could be the subjected to various forms of punishments for their crimes, including banishment. Number seven, first for everything. Egyptian gods created other Egyptian gods in creative and beautiful ways. Egyptian mythology says the first ever god, Ra, was born out of the sea. Ra, or Autumn, was eager on having children and creating other gods, but without a partner, you know, being alone and the universe and all, the process can be quite difficult. It's a lonely road being a god and all, so mythology also shows that Ra did end up having children. He created Shu, the god of air, and Tefnut, the goddess of moisture. But in order to do so, Ra had to breed with his own shadow. Yeah, his shadow, like Peter Pan, you know what I mean? And in order to give birth, said children were spat out of Ra's mouth. That's pretty bad. That's pretty crazy, but it's still not as crazy as a seahorse giving birth. Yeah, I'd rather witness Ra giving birth out of his mouth than a seahorse. 
any day. You shoot them out by the millions. Number six, the Lady of Terror. If Raw has you shaking in your boots, wait until you hear about the Lady of Terror. Okay, again, great name. Sekhmet is a lion-headed goddess, so again, appearance-wise, pretty jarring to come across. Now, this goddess got the nickname by controlling diseases. Now, on paper, that sounds like something we could definitely benefit from. But Sekhmet could also spread pestilence and plagues against anybody who pissed her off. So, yeah, not ideal. Imagine if your ex could control plagues and pestilence. You know what I mean? Wouldn't be a good time. You'd be f Sekhmet's name is derived from the Egyptian word for power, which is just what you want in your local physician. Nice. Number five, scarab worship. Ancient Egyptians worship scarabs aka dung beetles, the ones that roll a poop. Yeah, you know them. When we think of animals in relation to ancient Egyptians, we always go to cats first. But really, it was dung beetles that Egyptians couldn't keep their hands off. They were also known as scarabs back in the day, but Egyptians would observe these scarabs rolling around these balls of dung, and they would roll them along the ground until suddenly each beetle disappeared into their hole. Now, ancient Egyptians compared these patterns to that of the sun, which of course leaves at the end of our day, spoiler alert, and the god Kefri was depicted as a man with a massive scarab scarab as a head. And he was also responsible for rolling the sun across the sky every day. And then, of course, he put it back into his little hole. Number four, sweat perfume. This next one here reminds me of Gwyneth Paltrow's goop. You ever hear of that? Google that after you're done here. What a ride that is. Here we go. Ra, the Egyptian sun god, he was born from a giant body of water when life first began. I mentioned this earlier in our list. You remember the whole, ah, hey kids, giving birth thing? Yeah, him. Well, in ancient Egyptian mythology, many thought perfumes were made out of Ra's sweat. Wet, and Egyptians would cover themselves, just lather themselves in that. Perfume back then wasn't like the kind that we see now, obviously. Ancient Egyptians would apply oil-based perfumes all over their body, which mainly consisted of water lilies from the Nile. Today it's a little different. Today it's like Playboy Malibu, or like Axe Body Spray, or Lynx, if you're in Britain, there you go. What happened, right? Bring back the sweat oils from gods. I would much rather buy that from my local pharmacy. Number three, dirty trick. The god Osiris ruled over ancient Egypt, but it wasn't an easy path. Just like ancient Rome, there's always going to be a jealous brother. Osiris' brother, Set, was a jealous brother, so he tried to take out Osiris at every turn. One elaborate plot was so crazy that it actually worked. This was like a saw trap setup. This was nuts. First, Set designed a coffin that matched Osiris' measurements to a T. So at a party, casually one day, Set challenged Osiris to hop into said coffin, saying that if he can fit inside of it, the coffin coffin is then his, you know, like a gift, like a gift coffin. I always wanted one of those for the holidays. So for some reason, Osiris accepted the challenge, he jumped in, and as soon as Osiris got into the coffin, Set locked him inside through the coffin in the Nile River. Yeah, and in turn, Set then took over control of Egypt. So if any of your coworkers want to show you a coffin in the break room, you should respectfully decline that offer. Number two, heart eater. Like I mentioned earlier with the goddess of plagues, ancient Egyptians saw their gods as helpful healers, but at the same time, you know, balance, they would be quite dangerous. Khonsu, for example, the god of the moon, is famously known as the god of healing. Now, if you watched Moon Knight on Disney+, Plus, this should ring a bell. Khonsu also had a reputation for eating human hearts. I mean, ironically, it's the perfect scenario. It's quite balanced, right? Amit would be happy with this one. He heals, but he also eats hearts. So it's like, which H are we gonna get, right? The healing heart or the hungry heart? And finally, number one, pet party. Are you a pet owner? If so, comment down below. I wanna see what animals are running about. Which animals fill your house? We were always a dog family growing up. My aunt has three pugs. It's really the dream come true. I want three wiener dogs. That's really my goal in life. But ancient Egyptians, they fancied a house pet or two and they were a little different. Egyptians saw animals as incarnations of the gods. The very concept of having a pet came from ancient Egyptians. Egyptians were of course fans of cats. That's common knowledge at this point. But did you know that they also had the same idea for hawks, lions, dogs, and even baboons? I thought dogs doing their business inside of the home was was annoying. But a lion? Imagine waking up to that, I'd be like, ugh, where do I even start? Many of these animals were often mummified and buried with their owners after they had died, just like how today many owners cremate their pets. The little paw print on the tiny vase, it's always so sad. You're like, oh, who's this? Ugh. I'm not sure I would mummify a shih tzu, but you know, hey, whatever floats your boat, go for it. Other creatures were also specifically trained to work as helper animals. Ancient Egyptian police officers would use dogs and monkeys to help patrolling. Imagine that. Imagine you steal bread for your family and you look back and a baboon is chasing you down? Number 10, Hathor. The goddess Hathor was originally created by her dad, Ra, as a destroyer of men. She was supposed to punish all those who were disobedient to him. But then Ra was like, meh. 
I don't really like that idea. He just kind of changed his mind and decided to make her the exact opposite. Instead, the goddess of love. But she kind of loved killing men and like even he couldn't stop her. So one night he gave her what was supposed to be a mug of ale but actually made it like a special kind of blood and she got so drunk off of it that she got too tired out to kill anymore and therefore became the goddess of love. <laughs> drunk in love, am I right? Her cult was centered in Dendera where she was also seen as the goddess of fertility and childbirth. When the Greeks occupied Egypt, they compared her with the goddess Aphrodite. But unlike the voluptuous woman Aphrodite was depicted as, Hathor came in three forms and I bet you can't guess which. She was depicted as either a woman with a cow's ears, wearing the headdress of a cow, or just a cow. Moo. <laughs> Number nine, the beginning of the world. I yeah, what a what an inventive way to imagine the beginning of things. I mean, the Big Bang is still pretty crazy too. But hey, here we go. Freaking love how much magic is in these stories. Like I'm in because that's all there was at the beginning of the universe, according to the ancient Egyptians. Just swirling darkness, chaos, and magic. Heka, the god of magic, was the only thing that existed, waiting for the opportune moment to begin. Then a hill showed up called Ben Ben, and out of which the god Atum erupted from. He was lonely, so he mated with his own shadow to give birth to two children, Shu and Tefnut. Shu gave life, Tefnut gave order. They left their father to build the world, but they were gone so long he took out his eye and sent it to search for them. In the meantime, he just kind of sat there contemplating eternity all alone. He was really sad. This guy sounds like Zeus mixed with Eeyore. Anyways, his kids came back and he was so happy he wept tears of joy and out of which were born men and women. They also brought his eye back, so that was nice. Number eight, light as a feather. So unlike a lot of religions we've heard of, there wasn't really a concept of hell in Egyptian mythology. It was either you were worthy of heading into the afterlife or you weren't. Mat was the goddess of harmony and supported the belief that if harmony was disrupted, it must be restored. Every ancient Egyptian myth in some form follows this format. But the most important role she played was in the afterlife. When the soul left the body, it would appear in the hall of truth in order to stand judgment before Osiris. The heart would be weighed on a golden scale against Mat white feather. If the heart was heavier, it would be devoured by a monster and the soul would disappear. If it was lighter, then you could go live in eternal bliss. So instead of several layers of burning torment, souls in Egypt instead faced eternal darkness and unconsciousness. The idea of non-existence was more terrifying than being cut up by demons. Huh. Number seven. Punishment. More commonly, punishments for women in ancient Egypt might have included fines, corporal punishments, or forced labor. For serious crimes, especially those that threatened the social order or involved treason, more severe punishments like execution might be applied, but in some cases for less serious offenses, women might be required to pay fines. These fines could be in the form of money, goods, or livestock. Women, particularly those of lower social status, could be sentenced to perform labor as a form of punishment. This might involve agriculture work, construction, or other forms of manual labor. Depending on the nature of the offense, a woman Women's property or belongings could be confiscated as a form of punishment. As mentioned earlier, banishment was a possible punishment for serious offenses. Number six, beatings. In ancient Egypt, like in many ancient societies, corporal punishment, including beatings, could be a form of punishment for women, particularly for offenses that were considered serious or morally reprehensible according to the prevailing nature and culture and legal norms. It's important to note that the application of punishment varied depending on factors such as societal status and specific time period and the region within ancient Egypt. Corporal punishments such as whipping, beating, or other forms of physical punishment could be administered for various offenses. This might be more common for crimes like theft or adultery. Examples would be like switches, flexible branches, or vines could have been used for beatings. They would be capable of inflicting pain without causing severe injury, as wooden paddles with a flat surface could also be used for beating as well. They would also have been effective in delivering blows to specific areas of the body, and the simplest form of beating would be involved with the hands and fists. This method would also be easily accessible and wouldn't have to require any specialized tools, as well as whips, sticks, and rods. Number five, strangulation. Now for the more morbid section on this list, although stoning may seem like a common thing in this era as a form of capital punishment, whereas an individual is pelted with stones until death, actually was not common associated with ancient Egyptian legal practices based on available historical and archaeological evidence. The primary method of execution in ancient Egypt was typically strangulation or impalement. Stoning as a form of capital punishment is more commonly associated with other ancient cultures in the region, such as ancient Mesopotamia or parts of the Levant. In these societies, stoning was indeed 
indeed known as a form of capital punishment for various offenses, including adultery. Strangulation was the one of the most common methods of execution in ancient Egypt. It was typically used for serious offenses and could be applied for both men and women. In cases where capital punishment was seemed necessary, strangulation was a method of employed to carry out the sentence. Number four, lacerations. When it comes to corporal punishments, as I mentioned above, those who do commit adultery might deal with the consistency of beatings or lacerations. Texts speak of thrashing with a wooden stick give 10 to 20 to 50 to 100 or even 200 times. They also mention branding and mutilation of the nose and ears. Tomb reliefs often show beatings of people, but in most cases, these are private coercions of subordinates, not an official penalty. Sometimes the culprits are bound to a pillory. These punishments were all carried out in public and therefore also meant a loss of honor and degradation of the culprits. The results of these measures can be seen on many skeletons as they are also including cutting off limbs, noses, and other parts of the body as a form of punishment, specifically connected to adultery or if you were married, specifically a married woman. It is a crime deserving of death as it is easier to commit any other sin after that. The husband had a legal right to punish or forgive his wife or leave the court if the husband accuses the wife with no proof. The punishment of a man was much lighter and the woman of the crime of adultery as the Egyptians believed that offense falls primarily in the hands of the woman while the women would be killed as the men would severe just a thousand blows. Number three, burning alive. Referring back to the code of Hammurabi, the code was enlisted under the morals and the laws in ancient Egypt and Babylon. When it came to intimate relationships with your close family, you'd be subjected to many listed punishments as in dealing with seduction or physically harming someone intimately. The Hammurabi inflicts the penalty of burning if you were to have a physical intimacy with your mother, but since this was ancient Egypt, unless you were royal who needed to pull an epidus complex to maintain your rule, and connection to the monarch position, it wasn't something looked down on but normalize. As this is a civilization that needed a monarch rule at all times to guide the nation, but it is good to note that it was a typical Western interpretation that this era was prone to burning alive people, when the irony was that the Europeans burning women, being witches, or even more heresy were more burned. Number two, head be gone. The ancient Egyptians set harsh punishments for those accused of treason or corruption. The death penalty was usually applied by impalement, thumping, or a hundredfold fine, and this applied to both men and women. The decree also referred to the death penalty for someone who steals an animal belonging to the temple and transfer it to another party, while confiscating the property of the thief in favor of the stolen temple. The ancient Egyptians distinguished between the stolen goods and the bear the attribute of holiness and considered it a religious crime that requires execution, and those stolen goods that do not affect the sanctities, settling for the penalties of beating, and the fine for the theft 100 times of the value of the stolen items. Number one, buried alive. Of course, all of these leads to death eventually as the punishments were drastic, dangerous, violent, and vile. I mean, if you somehow survived the beheading, then what a miracle that would be, but death was only reserved for the extreme measures of punishment for women of these times. As I mentioned, there was very minimal if not just the common punishment of corporal punishment. The scariest, in my opinion, would be buried alive. In some cases, individuals might be sentenced to be buried alive, although this was likely a very rare extreme form of punishment, most likely only reserved for the ones with extreme cases of crime. It's important to keep in mind that our knowledge of specific cases and punishment in ancient Egypt is limited, as much of what we know is derived from inscriptions, legal texts, and other historical records. Additionally, practices may have varied over time and in different regions of ancient Egypt. The legal systems and punishments evolved over the millennia, so there could be variations in practices depending on the specific period within ancient Egypt history. Kicking off the list at number 10, KV55. Located in the Valley of the Kings in Egypt, Tomb 55, otherwise known as KV55, was found by Edward Arden back in 1907. It was discovered right next to King Tut's tomb, and the reason we call this tomb by a number rather than name is because we really don't know who was inside it yet. Even the walls outside of the tomb, they aren't covered with any hieroglyphs to tip us off or give us any hints. It's just bare, which is kind of eerie. As you walk down the 20 steps towards KV55, you'll notice markings on the entrance. Markings that show that the entrance was widened since it was first cut, along with its ceilings being raised higher. So whatever was in there needed the room. The only hint as to who was buried remains on the walls. One hieroglyph remains and it was discovered in 1907 and it translates to the evil one that shall not live again. Even these massive stones were built in order to prevent anything from getting out. See, usually with these ancient tombs, it's the opposite. The description for who's inside the tomb had also been destroyed. So we have no idea who or what is in KV55. Number nine, King Teti. The Pyramid of Teti was built for the first ruler of the 6th dynasty, and while it's not flashy or massive as these other pyramids, the insides contain the oldest writing in the religious world. Pretty insane. Now these texts go back to 2400 BC, way back when we used, you know, BBM. The pyramid texts were specifically written so that this King Teti could ascend to the heavens after his death. 
There are spells and incantations meant to free the king's soul and arrive in the cosmos. More specifically, for Teti to become a star in the sky and then join Osiris and Orion in the God Squad. There's even instructions on how to preserve the body and travel to said heavens. World's oldest instruction manual for the win. Number 8. Queen Nefertiti After a scan was done on King Tut's tomb, there were cracks found on the north and earth walls. East. Taylor, east, not earth. There were cracks found on the north and east side walls. So we believe that this is a secret passageway to Queen Nefertiti, the ruler during the 14th century BC, and also wife to King Tut. Queen Nefertiti's parents are also still unknown to this day, so that adds to it. And with ancient texts depicting that these kings and queens would leave Earth and then later return, perhaps they are both descendants of extraterrestrials. And this flying sun disk that they worshipped was not the sun, but rather a winged alien ancestor. Number seven, Osiris and Isis. Okay, so we aren't strangers to deities being a fan of incest. It was kind of like how they multiplied and ancient Greeks were okay with it kind of, but they kind of weren't. Anyways, the Egyptian gods were no exception. Isis and Osiris were two of the four children of the goddess of Nut. Isis and Osiris were married and actually really in love. They, they, they dug each other. When Osiris rose to the throne as the eldest sibling, his brother Set was pretty jealous. So he took the life of his own brother, cut him into little pieces, and scattered them all over Egypt. He really wanted to make sure the guy was dead. But then Isis wasn't someone you wanted to mess with. She had great magical powers capable of restoring life. She collected all of the pieces of her brother slash husband and breathed life back into him. Osiris returned to life and they made all the love and then soon conceived a child named Horus. However, Osiris couldn't return to the land of the living, so he had to stay and rule over the underworld. So his son Horus was left to get revenge, and we'll get to that later. Number six, Anubis. Now, I think in West Western films that depict ancient Egypt, like The Mummy Returns, the god Anubis is often associated with the underworld. You know, that creepy half man, half jackal creature who appears to walk out of your nightmares? Like, he's so creepy. Well, he did used to run the underworld until Osiris took over, but he was actually the god of mummification and the afterlife. So, not wrong, but not the whole story. Anubis was the son of Nephthys and Set. Well, Kind of. Nephthys actually never conceived the child with Set. She kind of had a, she kind of had the hots for Osiris. So she disguised herself as Isis and made love to him that way. And then Anubis came to life. That may have been one of the reasons Seth attacked Osiris in the first place, as his suspicions rose. But it was actually Anubis who helped Isis piece together Osiris, creating the first mummy. Fun fact. During the Greek rule of Egypt, Anubis and Hermes were seen kind of as the same, the people who ferried the dead to the underworld. Oh, sorry, and a point. Anubis was actually the one who weighed people's hearts, so he used the feather, the thing, you know what to do. He was responsible for doing that. Number five, Horus and Set. Speaking of Horus, earlier. Remember how I said Horus had to take over defending his father? Well, here is where this story begins. When Horus grew up to be a man, he pulled a Hamlet. He was like, you killed my father, prepare to die. Thus, a series of battles ensued, and one of the gods didn't play fair. Set kept cheating at everything and continued to come out as victor. Not surprising since he didn't earn his way on the throne, he killed for it, kind of like a certain Claudius. Eventually Isis stepped up to help her son slash nephew overcome her brother. She set a trap for Set, but after some pitiless begging for his own life, she let him go. Horus was pissed, so angry some of the other gods got upset that he was so angry. They agreed to compete in a final boat race and Horus was like crushing it. He was doing really well, he was about to win. But then of course, Set cheated by turning into a hippopotamus and attacked the boat. Therefore claiming victory once again. Osiris finally showed up and declared that no man should take the throne through murder. So Horus took the throne. Why Osiris didn't just settle the whole deal from the beginning is confusing in itself, but hey, kind of reminded me of the eagles that showed at the end of Lord of the Rings that could have saved like three movies, you know? Kind of like that. Anyways, let's move on. Number four, Ra and his boat. Ra is one of the most revered gods in Egyptian mythology, especially since he was the god of the sun. He was depicted as a man with the head of a falcon. That kind of makes sense. He was once the greatest of all gods, but had to take a step back after he got too old and tired, and especially considering his task, I can see why. His job was to drive away darkness and sail across the skies, delivering light wherever he went. But at night, he would dive into the underworld and have to cross 12 gates. 12 hours an hour per gate. After paying his respect to Osiris every night, a giant snake named Apophis tried to attack and swallow the boat. Every night! 
Poor guy. No wonder he got worn out. Every day it got harder to defend, and even one night, Apophis succeeded, but could only hold the sunlight for so long. She threw it up, which explained solar eclipses. After Set was cast out after the whole nephew battle, he ended up serving Ra in his boat and kept the snake at bay. But there's something confusing coming later that I think you'll agree is very confusing. So here we go. Coming up next, we have Bast, number three. Have you ever had a cat look you up and down and kind of like expect something? Like worship, you know? Are you a cat person, dog person? Let me know in the comments. Well, that's because cats were a big deal in Egyptian mythology. They even had their own goddess. Bastet was a cat goddess depicted as a woman with a cat's head. Cats had a meaningful role in ancient Egypt as they protected their food from rats and snakes. They were even seen as family members, and to harm one was punishable by death. Legend says that sometimes cats would enter burning buildings to save their families. If they died, the goddess would bring them back to life, hence the idea of cats having nine lives. There it is. Now here's where things get confusing. You know that story I told about Ra? Well apparently Bastet was in the boat with him as well. During the day she would ride with him, and at night she would turn into a cat and then defend the boat from Apophis the snake. But I thought that was set. So many conflicting things. I saw like a couple different stories who said, each thing was different, so who knows. Number two, Jeb and Nut. Yet another sibling partnership, we have Jeb and Nut. They fell deeply in love and could never be separated. They were that couple who would like constantly be like, oh my god, stop, right next to each other at dinner, you know what I mean? Jeb was the god of the earth and Nut was the god of the sky. A previously mentioned god, Atum, found their union inappropriate, so he pushed Nut into the sky far away from Jeb. He just didn't like being a third wheel. Jeb and Nut were close enough to see each other, but could never hold each other again. And she gave birth to Osiris, Isis, Set, and Nephthys. Some say Horus too, but I don't think that's true. Number one, the treasure thief. Okay, I don't know how I feel about this story, okay? This doesn't really feel like harmony is in balance, but anyways. The treasure thief ends in a way I really didn't expect, and I'm not sure you will either. Long ago, a great pharaoh with a wealth of riches decided to build a pyramid in which to keep them safe. One of the builders was wise to his plan and decided to find a way to claim them for himself. He built a stone vault with a hidden entrance covered by a slab so he could get to the riches. But unfortunately, he fell ill before he could return, so he told his sons of his plan. The sons headed to the pyramid in the dead of night, following their father's order, but unbeknownst to them, the pharaoh had laid booby traps and one brother was caught in one. Not wanting to be found or interrogated, revealing his other brother, he told his brother to chop his head off. Ugh, that he did. Loyalty? I don't know. The pharaoh upon finding the body hung it up in the town square in the hopes of like weeding out whoever it belonged to. But the other brother being so clever got the guards drunk and stole back his brother's body in the dead of night. The pharaoh was like, I'm not even mad. I'm just impressed. He gave the thief a pardon, summoned him to the square and gave his daughter to marry him. Yeah, dude, you tried to steal my jewels? Don't worry about it. Have my daughter, because you're so talented at your job. Number 10, the time warp. Okay, here's a very trippy fact for you. We all know ancient Rome, right? The lovable empire that took over a large portion of the world at its peak. Trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. Caesar, Augustus, the Colosseum. Yeah, those guys, we all know how long ago that was, right? 2,000 years or more. They were pretty cool dudes. Today, they are remembered for being a very successful empire and their triumphs. Well, what if I told you that the Romans are to us what the ancient Egyptians were to the Romans? Does that make sense? That makes sense. And they were still alive to tell the story. Well, at least some of them and some of it. Yes, that's right. When Rome was taking over, it was understood that Egypt was a land of great antiquity and there was much to learn. However, most of what we know of Egypt comes from Egyptian tombs, pyramids, and Egyptology from the early 20th century. Still pretty cool though. Number nine, board games. Call me crazy, but I love board games. My two favorite are arguably the most depressing. One being an actual fictionalized version of life and seeing who can rack up the biggest mortgages after having six kids as a police officer with a chef's salary. Ooh, fun. And the other is a recreation of the real estate moguls that charged exuberant amounts of rent during the Great Depression in the 30s. Wow, fun. Thanks, Parker Brothers. This may be because I have ancestors in ancient Egypt. 
I, I probably don't, but uh, we're just gonna roll with that joke anyway. I make bad jokes like that because ancient Egyptians loved board games. That, that was my connection. Yeah, I know, right? Games like 20 Squares, Hounds and Jackals, which is pretty much just Snakes and Ladders, and the most popular, Semet which tasks players with moving their pieces on squares and eventually off the board. Kind of like Sorry, which is also one of my favorite games. I love Sorry. And I think that we had a Canadian version called Getting Into Trouble. You know, the thing in the middle and you bop it. Remember that thing, the dice, remember that? And you said, what are you guys doing? Getting into trouble, mom. So lame, so lame, dude. Number eight, Labor Strike. To say that it took a lot of manpower to build the pyramids, or really anything the ancient Egyptians ever built, is a little bit of an understatement. A lot of work went into it. Not only are the builds massive in scale, but also extremely complex and detailed, fooling some engineers today. They don't know how exactly they did it. Can you imagine building or moving all of those massive stones in the African heat and sun? I would need so much water. Just like today, it's really hot today. Well, as it turns out, this wasn't always the greatest job on planet Earth. Oh, surprise! And in one incident in the 12th century BC, the workers under Ramsay III organized what may have been the very first labor strike. The workers had not received their grain rations and thus hid away in the monasteries until their woes were heard. It worked, and they were given their rations. Oh, so cool. The first labor strike, that's so weird. They have modern stuff too. Wow. Number seven, dozer. For this one, we're looking into some bull worshipping, so grab your red scarves and start waving them around. Just north of the step pyramid of the Pharaoh Doser, archaeologist August Marionette discovered this site in 1851. The Serapium is a temple dedicated to the Egyptian deity Serapis, a combination of Osiris and Apis in human form. Now, this was a large burial ground for the Apis bulls. They were basically these bulls that were said to be sacred, and after their death, they would become immortal. Remember that, that's important. Today at Saqqara, there's this massive vault. It's 382 yards long, and it's carved out of sandstone bedrock. It's massive, and along the sides of them are 24 chambers, each with sarcophagus carved out of a single chunk of granite. Now, inside these boxes were animal remains, just bones and all. But back then, in those times, you weren't allowed to break up any bodies. That was a no-go. You had to mummify them. So how are these tombs built, first of all, so perfectly, weighing over 80 tons, and where do these bones come from? Perhaps these are the remains of the Apis bull. After all, that's the inspiration for the Minotaurs, so maybe alien ancestors looked a lot more jacked than we may think. Number six, dung beetles. This one isn't exactly a pharaoh at all, but it's too good to leave out, especially if we're talking about aliens here. It's important. Dung beetles, also known as scarabs, are the only species in the entire world that follows the Milky Way. Think about that for a second. That is, let's talk about it. Some animals follow the sun. You know, turtles sprint to the ocean the second they're born to avoid getting plucked up by birds. Now these insects would follow the line of the Milky Way and then roll their towards it. Literally, they're, they're poop. They would roll it towards the skies, which is insane. Symbols of these beetles are seen all over, either in hieroglyphics or even in movies, their presence is known. Near the sacred lake at the Temple of Karnak, there is a massive scarab monument. And there's even a legend still to this day behind said statue that if you walk around it nine times, you would find health, wealth, and love. And you'd also probably be a little bit dizzy. The scarab is there to represent the god Kefri, which at the time Egyptians believed was the sun as well. Also known as a scarab face god, which terrifying when you imagine that. Are these bugs just trying to get home into space to their bug alien master? Why does he need so much poop? Whatever DIY project they're working on in the Milky Way probably doesn't smell too good. Number five, Lord Nefertiti room. For this next piece of evidence, we'll be directing our focus to the land down under. Australian aliens, baby, let's do it. In the Brisbane Water National Park, to be specific. Egyptian hieroglyphs educate us on our past. There's still so much we don't know, but it's fun to find UFO looking objects within them. It's fun to speculate, as we are right now. But when Egyptian texts appear around the world in the middle of nowhere, those UFO hieroglyphs get a bit more concerning. Like the Gosford Glyphs, for example. Discovered in the 1970s at Karyong, there's around 300 engravings spread over two sandstone walls. The hieroglyphs are strikingly similar to that of Egypt. There's birds, even the markings of a scarab, which are those Milky Way poop pushers that I just talked about earlier. Egyptologist Raymond Johnson believes that this is the burial site of Egyptian royal family member Lord Nefertiru, who met his fate around 2600 BC, with some panels telling the story of two prince brothers who came from Egypt and subsequently became shipwrecked. But other panels get into the extraterrestrial goodness. Some of these Gosford glyphs have UFO shapes, with scarabs, birds, and sun symbols popping up as well. Maybe we did have alien aid when it came to laying these royal family members to rest. Number four, Usurkaf. 
Remember earlier when I was talking about those extremely heavy granite coffins? Well, the Sun Temple in Egypt may give us more alien clues as to their purpose. Discovered in 1842, this was the base of a giant monument that apparently used to stand over 150 feet tall. Built by the pharaoh Yuzakaf, founder of the 5th dynasty of Egypt, the temple translates to Stronghold of Ra. Ra being the sun god. This temple at Abu Ghraib was home to one of the world's largest monoliths and its purpose may blow your mind. This obelisk was built out of granite. Now they made things out of granite back then because it contained quartz. Quartz, due to piezoelectricity, was able to convert the Earth's vibrations into energy. Nikola Tesla did something similar. He figured out standing waves, which was the ability to pass energy through the air. Perhaps these granite monoliths were used to teleport people or goods. That would explain the last point about those Australian glyphs. To be fair, I have zero idea how Bluetooth works either. Alien airdropped in Egypt. I'm here for this theory. Number three, Khufu. In order to become a god in the afterlife, these kings would build massive temples or pyramids. The Giza pyramids were built over 4,500 years ago, and to this day, they draw in about 15 million visitors a year. Pharaoh Khufu's is the largest pyramid in Giza, and it was the first pyramid that they started to build, obviously taking the longest. Reaching up to 147 meters high, it took 2.3 million rocks to create this landmark, and its alignment with Orion's belt gives it an extraterrestrial vibe, and with Tesla CEO Elon Musk tweeting aliens built the pyramids, obvi, we now have to ask just how did thousands of workers achieve this? The placement of the pyramid is also unique as well. It's aligned perfectly with the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. That much accuracy back then with the stars and the earth and the heavens, they must have gotten help from alien friends or else they had the world's biggest protractor. Number two, King Tut. Only a few years after King Tut's tomb was discovered in the Valley of the Kings, archeologist Howard Carter found two daggers that were buried with said king. It's not uncommon to be buried with your goods. It's why Egyptians would build these tombs in a certain way, so that grave robbers wouldn't snoop around and steal your entire family heritage. It was made so nothing could get out, which is insane. But two daggers were found with King Tut, one made of iron and the other gold. Now with iron being even more rare than gold in the Bronze Age, this was a big deal. And with recent advancements in technology, we were able to use a technique called portable X-ray fluorescence spectrometry. And according to the journal Meteorites in the Planetary Science, the blade is actually made of iron, nickel, and cobalt, suggesting that this material is of extraterrestrial origin. And finally, number one, the Great Pyramid of Cholula. There are many parallels between Egyptian and Maya civilizations. The two cultures are so far apart, both in time and distance, and they also never made contact. But both pyramids are made with steps and both have stone serpents. The vault arches are also strikingly similar and hieroglyphs within share a lot of the same symbolism. These hieroglyphs include advanced mathematics that they say was bestowed upon them also from these sky gods. Was this just one landing site of our alien ancestors? Let us know in the comments below all your thoughts. Number 10, false doors. Okay, right off the bat, imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb, all right? Imagine you've spent years of your life dedicating to this research, and then you find a door. You find an entrance carved into the wall, and this is it. What lies beyond? It's time. You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it's a fake door. It's a false door. Yeah, just a Looney Tunes door. Somebody juked you out 4,500 years ago. Gotcha. Their spirit's been waiting that long to be like, nice, idiot. All right, we can go. We're good. False doors in Egyptian tombs were quite common in ancient Egyptian times. But if we look elsewhere throughout history, we find false doors in ancient Rome, in both tombs and the interior of homes. So that ought to be confusing for any house guests back then. It's also important to note that Egyptian culture was influenced by Mesopotamian architecture. So we've had fake doors around for a while now. A lot of confusing people for thousands of years. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead, and that spirits were able to travel here and there throughout living and death. Most false doors can be found on the West Wall because Egyptians believed the West to be the land of the dead. Number nine, the tomb of Uzer. Back in March 2010, the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities released this photo. This six foot tall slab of pink granite was carved over 3,500 years ago, and this door was found near Karnak Temple in Luxor, and originally it belonged to the chief minister of Queen Hatshepsut back in the 15th century. Now, Uzer was a high ranking official and held the position of vizier for 20 years at that time, so in turn, he got his own fancy tomb located on the west bank of the Nile. Remember, Egyptians associate the west with the land of the dead. That's gonna come in quite a few times in this video. The actual slab of granite, this door, was found far away from its home. It had been moved thousands of years later and ended up in an ancient Roman era building. Never thought I'd have to say this, but um, don't steal doors from the dead. Got it? Okay, let's move on. Number eight, Alexandria Black Tomb. 
What if we found a tomb and then just opened it, you know? What if we found a mysterious black granite tomb in Alexandria, say back in 2018? Do you think it would be wise to just open it because we're curious? Spoiler alert, we opened it and it was exactly what we thought it was going to be. When archaeologists found this massive tomb untouched for over thousands of years, on one hand, yeah, that's a feat in itself, but us humans, we're curious creatures. We just gotta, just a little peek just to see who's in there. I mean, after all, it could be Alexander the Great, right? That's the whole point of all this. Egyptian news outlet El Watan reported that the tomb was lifted only a few centimeters before every official involved at that construction site just fled the scene. They straight up just ran away. It smelled that bad. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, this guy put his entire head in the tomb just to show us that it's safe. That's great. I mean, you could use your hand, maybe even a foot, I guess, just a little foot dip, but straight to the head dipping? Come on, Mr. Waziri, be smart about this. Number seven, time warp again. Okay, here's one that's just kind of a head scratcher, but very true. And it has to do with the age of the Great Pyramids. The truth is, those bad boys are old, really old, older than your grandpa. And for a lot of ancient Egypt's history, they were there, regardless if the citizens actually knew anything about them. Constructed around 2560 BC, a long time ago. Cleopatra, the most famous of all pharaohs, and the chicest of all celebrities in the 60s. I mean, come on, it's Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, she's a good looking gal. Despite what modern depictions of ancient Egypt will have you believe, Cleopatra actually lived closer to the moon landing than she did the construction of the pyramids. Which is really hard to think about. She was closer to JFK, the pyramids, Vietnam, and not the pyramid. That's wow. That's a. That's a. It's kind of hard for my brain to wrap my head around that. Number six, bowling. The next time you find yourself in a bowling alley and find yourself a little queasy, and you're not sure if it's the smell coming from your bowling shoes or the radioactive microwave nacho cheese you just ate at the snack counter, you can thank the Egyptians. No, not because they made sure to play weird animations on the outdated TVs hanging from the ceiling that were outdated the second you walked in there as a kid. They're old then. Or the carpet that screams 1980s and please wash me. But because they invented the game itself, usually done with stone pins and a stone ball. It was quite popular amongst the crowns back then. Very cool. Obviously they didn't have the animations, but I think that makes it. You know those, remember those, you know those weird like bowling animations you know what I'm talking about? Number five, bug repellent. Well, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I smell certain things, it reminds me of stuff. I'm like that rat in Ratatouille. Just, oh, I love fr France. It smells like France in there. I don't know. <laughs> Don't smell your own farts, Chief, I don't know. As summer is just about to begin for me, it's sunscreen, beer, and of course, bug repellent. I don't know exactly what's in the bug repellent, but I know it doesn't work very well, and I know it smells like it's shaving minutes off my life. Ooh, not good. Well, ancient Egyptians had their own version of bug repellent. When the pharaohs and royals wished to enjoy a picnic outside in the beautiful sun, oftentimes there would be bugs. So to prevent this, they found the next closest servant and slathered them in honey, lots of honey. Ooh, too much, and then place them a safe distance away from said picnic. Do this a few times, and you got yourself a bona fide fly trap. Now you can enjoy your picnic in peace. You know, just ignore the servants screaming because they're being eaten alive by flies and all kinds of bugs. Ooh, kind of gross. Number four, mouse toothpaste. A lot of things I can understand. There's a point to it all. It adds up. Checks out. The mouse toothpaste does not check out or add up. I talked to the chief and he said that's not it. Yes, the ancient Egyptians knew that dental hygiene was very important, as it is. Go brush your teeth. They knew brushing their teeth was important as, well, yeah, as it is. And it should be noted that they may have invented the toothbrush. Hmm, pretty cool. However, it is in my humble opinion that they missed the mark on the toothpaste. There's no Colgate around. Basically, you take a cute little mouse and you crush it up until it's just a paste or essence of a mouse, as they call it. Then to combat what I'm sure was a horrific scent, herbs and spices were added, oftentimes mint, for that minty fresh breath that everyone so needs. Disgusting, no thank you, I'll pass. Number three, mummies. Yes, we all know the ancient Egyptians had mummies. Pharaohs and kings wrapped up like a good Christmas gift in preparation for the afterlife. 
You may have heard some things about it, and I'm here to tell you all the awful stomach churning things you've heard. They're true. That's right. In particular, the removal of the brain. While the ancient Egyptians were incredibly smart and talented, the process for removing the brain had the same finesse your grandpa had trying to get ketchup out of a glass bottle. I'll get it eventually. Yep, it's coming. <laughs> I'll get it. A long iron stick was used to be inserted into the nose until it reached your brain, right past the fifth grade memories. The next step was to stir vigorously until you could lay the person on their stomach, and the brain came out in what was probably the most offensive pink slurry I've ever had the displeasure to think of. Disgusting. Disgusting? I can't believe you done that. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be sick. Number two, makeup. Surprise, surprise. The ancient Egyptians came up with another invention, makeup. The billion dollar industry that isn't going anywhere. You might be surprised to know that both men and women wore makeup back then. Although, today that's that's a case too. And a, a, as an actor, I've worn makeup a lot. It's really not that big of a deal, really. What is a big deal, however, is how they made it. If you've ever seen any images of Egyptians, then you know how blue and green eyeliner is a must have. Well, the main ingredient in that eyeliner isn't paint, folks. It's beetles and bugs. Gross. Colorful bugs were crushed up and added to make compounds in order to achieve the Egyptian look. Number one, shepherd of the anus. Like I said before, the Egyptians contributed greatly to art, medicine, engineering. They were smart. But for the last point today, we're gonna focus on medicine, and more specifically, the doctors who were most likely the first proctologists. Way to go, Egypt. The Egyptian for these behind doctors literally traits to shepherd of the anus. They would administer medicine, and of course, the always famous and pleasurable enemas. They loved enemas in ancient Egypt, who would've thought? They thought, they thought it was a gift from the gods. Crazy. Yeah.